boom, brand new podcast, boom, brand new podcast. And this one is fucking hilarious. These two guys, I've known Greg for as long as I've been in comedy. And Mike Gibbons is Greg's best friend from growing up. They went to college together. They have a podcast called Sunday Papers that I've seen clips on every week. Every week they get together, Zoom, and talk about the Sunday morning papers of the stuff going on in the news. And every time they make me laugh hysterically. Every clip they do. They're two of the best. And Mike Gibbons was the head writer on my show, The Cabin, on uh, Netflix. So I thought, and this is, by the way, where I want the future of this podcast to go. When things slow down around here, we're not gang shooting and trying to get everything done and making all the intros look the same. When things slow down around here, this is how I'd like to do it. Late at night, few people in the room, maybe three people total, and just 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 jam and just hang out. And and so this is the prototype of what I'd like, and I think you're going to love this episode. They are hilarious. Uh, obviously, Greg Fitzsimmons, Fitzdog Radio. Craig's been in the podcast game since day one. He's been in this for every one of the best stand up comic comics I know, and they've both been show running and writing on on shows forever, and I absolutely love them. Two of the funniest guys I know, Greg Fitzsimmons and Mike Gibbons. All right, love you. Love you. Love you. All righty. Oh, she's driving me fucking up the wall, <laughs> dude. That building a house. I was telling her we built a house in Santa Monica, and I and I literally got into it as they were sitting here, and I'm like. And it was 18 years ago. And I'm like, I still, the shoulders go up. We had to sue them. They're like, get in line. They love being sued. It's a badge of honor for them. <laughs> they're, they're in this, this weird rivalry with Boulder, Colorado, which Boulder's unaware of to be like the greenest city. Yeah. And all the subcontractors are like, I am never working for them again. I'm like, because we, to owners, we look like idiots, but we know how to do our job. It's just Santa Monica's fucking, ask your guys about Santa Monica, honestly. Really? Are they? Oh, yeah, no, they had legendary. an extra septic tank because they had an oh, extra we have. Bedroom. I'll tell you what though. I actually start leaning into like the things that they've made us add. Like one of the things are uh, rain barrels. There's like yep. black rain barrels everywhere around our house. To collect water. But I love it. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what, I don't know what it is about. Uh, no, I loved all that. I went above and beyond, but they'll get you in other ways. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they, the, this structure in, in and of itself is a nightmare because it's like, <laughs> I'm it's, here. And yeah. So wait, you say nightmare also. Yeah. Oh, I heard that. Somebody wrote that yeah. on Twitter. We both I, say and nightmare. You say, and yeah. you're like, as opposed to the traditional mayor. <laughs> mayor. Sounds so weird to hear nightmare. Yeah. Oh, I'm having a nightmare. So where's get, nightmare? Get me from? my candles so I can walk down and get yeah. some oh, dude, hot no, milk. Night, nightmare is the most bizarre thing ever. What is that? I say milk. I say nightmare. Milk, it, milk sounds. I say farhead. Farhead. It sounds weird. What about, what was the one? What was the one? What are you doing? A costume change? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's happening. Did this start? Are we? Have we started? Yeah, we started. We started. We started. Oh wow! Yeah, we started. yeah, yeah, we're on. Yeah, yeah, we're on. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah, why wouldn't we be? Oh, oh my god! Oh wait, <laughs> do you no, want to take have, back your nightmare? Wait, we have different voices and we had a wardrobe change. <laughs> wait a minute. How great would it be? But we got to put on our sclar masks. <laughs> that's like be, that's like being with your wife and, and like you're giving her a back rub and then all of a sudden you try to put your dick in her and you go, oh, we're having sex. <laughs> Again, this has started. <laughs> uh, uh, the wouldn't it be great if you could if you could if you could hear a podcast from like like night like Jerry Seinfeld if he had started one with yeah with like just in the nineteen eighty seven he was like oh we did one of these and you could hear the gossip the way podcasts used to be right. podcasts used to be so much more freer now i feel like every fucking podcast is about cancel culture and yeah. oh god did you hear who's getting canceled now and what about well, I, well, I can't believe they get ever take a it's i feel like that's all i ever talk about in a podcast well they, that's what we feel because you know ours everyone thinks is topical because it's the sunday papers and we go over the stories but we devolve into just <laughs> catching up and we're constantly, which you avoided. I like this technique. We're constantly like, oh, but wait, save it for the podcast. Like we, we start shooting this shit. Like, yeah. even if it's like here, like I'm enraged still right now because the 405 was just jammed. And I was like, where the fuck is everyone going? But it's like, that's a nice start to a podcast. Like the, the, like seeing the greeting in a way, you know what I mean? Like, right. what are you doing? What's going on? And we try to as little as we can. And then 
the podcast often is just the furthest thing from topical. It's catching up. It's talking about all that shit. And, and people then- trying to figure out like, when you're liberal, when you're young, as you get older, you just start to get more conservative. And so we're yeah. all over the place because we're both New York, New York bleeding heart liberals, you know, both our parents, New York Times reading. And now, but with not to bring up cancel culture, but like that no. kind of stuff comes up. And all of a sudden I find myself swinging really far right on a lot of social oh, stuff. Yeah. It's I remember when Bill Maher was a, a lunatic liberal. Yes. Right. And now all of a sudden... It's what's crazy. Dennis is, Miller. Dude. Oh, that guy. You, the, the, I, I get one of my favorite Dennis Miller. He, I called in. I'd never met him. I never, and he goes, this is what I love about Kreischer. And the way he said it, I went, oh, I feel like it's like Saturday night and I'm up sitting in my yeah. bed watching it. Yeah. Um, but, but it's crazy. Bill Maher's audience. Do you remember they used to do like when it first started, they do this obligatory, like any democratic uh statement they just all start clapping yeah and it was an almost annoying yeah and now it's almost like he said so, he was shitting on biden the other day saying at least when trump did it he said i put him in cages that's what i did yeah. biden's put him in cages not even calling the cages and like yeah and you're like the fuck happened to this audience yeah totally. yeah no i used to write for that show when it first started and we only were get we back then there was no internet yeah. That's how long ago, because it was politically oh, incorrect wow. back then. Yeah, on ABC. And we got we got the New York Times and we get the Washington Post. Like that was where we pulled our jokes from. There was no fucking New York Post. There was oh, no wow. Wall Street Journal. It was all like super everything was lefty. So is the New York is the New York Post a right wing ring? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. okay. Rupert so Murdoch. The Daily Mail? Right wing? Yeah, that's Rupert Murdoch also. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I'm, my stupid thing is Hamilton created the New York Post. I'm like, see, he didn't. He wasn't all great, fucking guy. <laughs> <laughs> I said, to, I said to Burr today. Uh, we were talking about Burr and I were talking about uh, about uh, casting people, casting you know indigenous people to play indigenous people, or oh, casting uh, a one armed person to play a one armed person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I said, well, yeah, it always goes that way, but it never goes the other way. You know, like you know. And he goes, yeah, Bert, no Puerto Ricans are playing Abraham Lincoln. And I go, I'm pretty sure they all played Hamilton, though. <laughs> but I haven't seen the movie. Wait, uh, oh, what was I just going to say? Oh, I was trying to write a joke about Fox News. I look at Fox News the same way I look at gay porn. I just kind of glance at it and go, I don't want to like that. <laughs> <laughs> next, Yeah, next thing you know, you're asleep with it clutched in your arms. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm like, how is Wipe this? In my mouth. <laughs> how is this so popular? <laughs> I'll tell you, the first hour, I wasn't that into it, but then it really starts to get to you. I hate when Fox News gets me and they just get my personality. You're like, fuck. They knew that fear button was there. Yeah, I don't want that to happen either. Well, that's why the Daily Mail always had a new a topless girl on the third page. Gets you, gets you in. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, God damn it. You guys have me laughing so hard. <laughs> so hard when it was uh Kanye got a hologram of, oh. <laughs> of, of oh. Robert Cardin. Yeah. <laughs> imagine, imagine if he came back. <laughs> Sweetie, you are such a disappointment. <laughs> like I can't even look at you. <laughs> what the fuck happened to this family? That keep in mind. Yeah. Where's, where's, yeah. I where's my boy Bruce? I <laughs> What the fuck? You have to keep in mind that that dad would have to be caught up on the porn tape on her sex tape. Like, yeah. He wasn't even around for no, that. He would have been like, you know, I expect a little fucking on the internet. That's fine, but the but the perfume line. This is getting ridiculous. Oh, insane! Yeah. That caught me off. You guys have the best fucking podcast, and, oh, I, thanks, and I, man. every time I fucking listen, you guys have me crying laughing. But it's funny because. Of course, like you guys are the two funniest human beings I know. Literally, the two oh, funniest man. human oh, beings thanks, I man. know. And I go, and I'm, and I, and I knew you guys did it, but I didn't. It wasn't until like I think it was that, and you guys posted on your Instagram, so yeah, I yeah, catch yeah. up with it there. And I was wondering, does it did did COVID make it easier to do? Because it seems like I now it's a lot more out there. Like I'm catching up on it yeah. now because you guys are zooming each other. I don't think we ever did it in person, did we? No, never. We did, you know. We started early. a year ago. Well, when you'd have me on your podcast, obviously we would do, I'd come to your house. But oddly, 
it surprises us. And, you know, coming from being television producers too, you can't predict when there'll be like chemistry. Could, like, could you have the same chemistry in the room? It'll be really weird. Like it's weird being in the same room with you right now doing a podcast. I know. Really? It is. And I'm wondering if like, I, and I'm guessing maybe we're a little less deferential in terms of rhythm. So, and it works that we kind of talk over a little bit, but it also has worked out well. Like it hasn't been a shit show of, sorry, you go, you go first. None of that. Never. That never happens. I know. Well, that happens with B Bill and I. Bill and I, Tom and I less. But when well, because do, Bill doesn't shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's two guys that never, you're, you're like, you're a host that sets people up. Bill's a guy that just goes, no, hold on. I, I'm yeah. funnier. Let me talk. <laughs> well, one time I, I do, uh, I said, I sat in, I was kind of like a sidekick on his early on and you had Burr in and I'm sitting there and you guys are talking. And then it was, it was, everyone's been in this situation. So something was said, I'm like, Oh, I got that. That's, that, that poked a little deep or whatever. And then like, it kind of went away for like, I don't know, 10 seconds. And then Burr came back and I'm like, Oh, all right. And then all of a sudden it ramped up fast. And I'm like, is this, is this a bit? And you guys just then went at it yeah. because you have such a long history. And I just was like, I'm slowly moving my chair yeah. over here because it's like, I don't know about this and I don't know how real it is. And I'm not going to pop in with zingers. Like, yeah, I'm going to get punched in the face. Uh, no, we start, we started together. I mean, Bill used to open for me in Boston when I'd, I'd been doing it five years and he'd been doing it for two years. Yeah. And uh, I just fucking love the guy. You know, we both have that same Irish Catholic anger. He's, in the suburbs of Boston. I was in the suburbs of New York and we lived in New York at the same time. And I think I feel comfortable attacking him, but Bill, like, Bill fights back. Oh, oh yeah. You think? And Bill, Bill will, you can say something and Bill will hold on to it for a month. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then all of a sudden it'll pop up and you can, you can see when he gets mad because yeah. it's a smile, but it's not a smile. Yeah. It's right. Like the, and, and you, and I know I said something to him today. I said something to him today that I that I thought was going to blow like before we started shooting yeah, yeah. I said something to him and he was like he was like oh uh huh, huh, and just got real heated I said I called him Billy Hot Seat and I go <laughs> and then I go I just we were talking about something I said oh, maybe we don't want to bring that up Bill as yeah. a joke right. you know and uh he goes he goes oh who is it? Who is it, Bird? Who are they? Is that real? Is that real? And I was like, hey, Bill, I'm also your co-host. And uh, you know, the fire's getting a little hot. They're going to start looking at me. And he goes, oh, that's what it is, huh? That's what it is. It's about you. Bert's gone Hollywood. He's reading trades now. He's reading trades. He's reading trades. <laughs> no, I remember our one of our fights was because he came in hot about divorce in California and how men get so fucked over in divorce. Right. <laughs> and I happen to have been a good friend of mine had just the opposite just happened with, uh, you know, the, the guy got the money and the woman got fucked over. And this is before you got divorced. So mm -hmm. I think I wasn't as enlightened about how bad it can be on a guy in a California divorce, but like my, uh, easy, my act, you know, I put the positive spin on it. What's that? Just that. I can't believe I'm getting half my <laughs> money. I never got half my money before. <laughs> I'm like, can I get 50%? Let's lock in that rate. I've never, like, does she know she's only getting half? She can't live on half. She's never lived on half. And this is in for the court will enforce it. So she spends more than half. Someone will come in and say, you got to give Mike back. I'm like, holy shit. I would have gotten out so much earlier. <laughs> yeah. 50% on the dollar? Fucking sign me up. You can't live off of half our yeah. money. And she pays the taxes on her half? Oh, my God. <laughs> Please. Oh, oh, it's, a, it's a total opposite when you're like the Eddie Murphy who oh. originally did the half. Yeah. If you're a super rich guy, half is a complete ripoff. You know, if you, whoever you are, if you're like rolling in and there's more than, you know, but when you're like kind of an average person, half, you know, all of a sudden yeah. it's like, wow, yeah, because yeah. the breadwinner, whether it's a woman or a man, the bread, <laughs> the breadwinner, can the listeners come back? The half of those, when the when the breadwinner never sees half the money, like they're not the spender in, in, in most cases. So anyway. Yeah, they're busy working. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Oh, so don't, anyway, don't you say and that in my house with three women. <laughs> Jesus, God forbid you mention that you pay for things. Oh, 
get fucking lit up and then told not to stand the way you're standing because you're standing like this. And who do you think you are, patriarchy? Yeah. Rip, put, oh, yeah. dude. <laughs> or that's really your job? Really? That's work? Yes, th that is working or whatever. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I go, girls, you want to know what writing looks like? Writing looks like this. That's what writing looks like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have to, I walk around stumped for a day. It doesn't look like I'm working, but I am. My daughter got to see me work for the first time. He was there on uh, St. Patrick's Day. We did a little show. And it was an outdoor show. And she just sees me leave the house. <laughs> she thinks I go stay in a spa in Toledo for the yeah. weekend and have a nice time. And then I come home. She doesn't realize. So she came out to the show and it's at a golf course outside. And I'm trying to perform. There's a fucking plane going overhead from the airport. Car alarms going off. Dogs <laughs> walking around because it's Venice. Little kid. And it's like, no, this is yeah. this is my life. Yeah. Now I got to make all these needy people laugh. <laughs> Do you see how hard it is to talk about fucking your mom? <laughs> you any idea? Oh, dude. dude, I was editing every, I was th halfway through every joke going, I can't talk about fucking a 17 year old. She's 17. <laughs> 17. <laughs> Crazy. Georgia today was, she wanted to go for a hike and the door was kind of open and I was in the man cave doing a podcast with Bill and Bill's, ranting about an opener going long on the podcast he's like and this fucking guy does 37 minutes i'm coming up going oh if you want to switch I, I i can close and then she just clearly thinks this is an entertainment like this why would anyone ever listen to this on a podcast yeah and just starts walking in and i'm like huh she's like are you podcasting and i was like yeah this is what we do and he's like and then and then this asshole does seven minutes the next show seven minutes leaves me high and dry now i gotta fill the fucking time she's just like People pay for this? Right, like, exactly. It's free. <laughs> exactly. People pay for this. Turn around, sweetie. See that two-story museum <laughs> yeah. behind you? Uh, speaking of St. Patrick's Day, can you believe it's a year? So we were doing the cabin, and you came up with the greatest plan for uh, your special was going to debut on St. Patrick's Day. Yep. And you were going to go rent. You had rent. You had already, it was already in place I got the, I at got, the store. I got the comedy store. I had, uh, I think, 17 comics. We were going to start at like 10 in the morning, yep. 8 in the morning, and go all fucking day. People were coming in. Everyone was coming in, too. It was like the biggest names in comedy ever. We were going to, we were going to. That's funny. I don't remember that. Well, no. <laughs> I wish it happened. <laughs> if it was the 18 biggest names. There, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was, no, I, but I hadn't even, I booked it out of like, and I was going to hit everyone up, everyone come in, and everyone was... No, your, podcasts, list, your list was still we had growing. podcasts in, in, the, in the OR, a show in the main room, VIP lounge in the belly room with a stream to the main room, um, outdoor food trucks. It was such a on big... On St. Patrick's fucking, Day? On St. Patty's Day. Wow. On that St. Patty's Day. That would have been Patty's amazing. Day. Over a year ago. Damn. I think, I think it was already sold out. If I'm not mistaken, it was already sold out. And then. Did you take a bath on that one? No. No, no money. Everybody walks away. Everything, everyone just was like, hey, show's not. And I was like, fuck. But I, I just planned it because I was like, in my head, the way I looked at it marketing wise was you bring all these people. Mm -hmm. And then when they come there, they also have their huge social media platforms. So you're getting people to come to your show and then, you know, put it in their stories, put it in their feed. And then. You know, and it's just a bunch of great talent. And then all of a sudden, everyone's mentioning my special. And yep. it turns out, turns out, stay-at-home orders are better than that. That if you tell everyone they're not allowed to leave their house, <laughs> they end up watching Netflix. Yeah, <laughs> right. So it worked out a lot better for me yeah, than my bullshit right. marketing plan. Right. Because, like, that was the, I mean, sadly, the two greatest things could have happened is the cabin and, and yeah. my special aired in a pandemic. When no one could, when literally my special aired when the two days after they said, no one leave your house yeah, and no one left their house. And, and I was on the front page. And I remember how many people were promoting your shit, uh, not your shit, your yep. very special, special. Thank you. Thank you. On, on uh, social media, like everybody jumped in. It was oh. amazing. It was, I, man, I got, I got very lucky. And then the, and then the cabin, I, I sincerely was terrified. I didn't know if that was going to be as well received as it was and people love that too yep, people ate it up that was the funniest fucking see i've never gotten to do what you guys do where like when you guys go in and make a tv show like all the the fucking writer's room the fun yeah, yeah. i had so much fun on that fucking show yeah and it was even just shooting it even all that stuff but my favorite part was going in and like 
and like taking meetings with Netflix or just sitting in the writer's room and coming up with ideas, yeah. coming up with ideas that we could never shoot ever and just going. I mean, that was like the funnest. I could, I would love working in television. No, maybe, yeah, it's a good, it's a good day. Be maybe I'll the, send you, it's on my, sorry, it's on my phone. Maybe I'll send you the video. Like, remember then we shot a solicitation tape to get guests to send to like Kevin Hart. To send to these people. So I forgot about that. So anyway, maybe we'll cut it in. I don't know if you cut things into this podcast, but yeah, we uh, can cut it in. Yeah. So I'll anyway, I'll send that. We'll see. I'll send this uh thing because I know it's on my Look phone and I Gibbs is it. producing your own podcast yeah, 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 yeah. now. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> this is a two-parter, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, there would be times like, what is it like? I'm curious because you guys have worked on a lot of shows. Yeah. Correct? Like, what was the funnest show you ever worked on? Like the where 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 you got because the cabin's really on my only television in the show I guess or I mean the travel channel but like a creative show where it's written you're writing it you're coming up with ideas you're like yeah and not going into that office was so much fucking fun for me because I had never I'd never been in that like where it's just uh oh have you seen this video come on over and everyone's watching a video and like what was the favorite what was your favorite show you worked on probably Lucky Louie which was Louis C.K.'s oh. HBO sitcom because it was just my life. I mean, Louie and I have had, we had kids at the same time. We lived in the same neighborhood out here. We lived in Boston at the same time, New York at the same time. And so like we, it was just so easy to access stories that he could relate to. Yeah. And the writer's room was just, it was great. Like Kit Boss and Mary Fitzgerald, who's our yeah. good friend, was in the room with us, who I knew from Boston separately from before I was a comedian. Yeah. And, uh, and it was just like, it was one of those jobs where, you know, some sitcoms, you get there at eight in the morning and you leave at midnight and you don't leave the writer's room the whole fucking time. And with Louie, it was like 10 a.m. We'll head out around 430 because you can get it done. You, you've you worked on sitcoms to go that long. It's, it's terrible. unnecessary. It's terrible. Yeah. At its worst, it's the it's really bad. Even like something that's a success and you all know you can see like summer homes. If you're writing on friends, you're still being tortured till 2 a.m. or even the shoots of friends. Like so some are really, really labor intensive and unnecessarily. My my show, The Great Indoors, was unnecessarily labor intensive. And then and then it starts to get stressful. And then mm -hmm. as a comedian, your job is you gotta lighten up the room. So like if I would pitch something and I re you realize halfway through it's a shit pitch. Yeah. But when you're there that many hours you have to just keep throwing shit at the wall. And so you have to start coming up with bits like I would I would my hands would start crawling up my chest and then I would choke <laughs> myself and I'd fall over backwards <laughs> in my chair and pretend to beat myself up. <laughs> And you guys, what was that bit you guys used to do at Killboard? Oh, someone would be like pitching their idea. And then all of a sudden you look down the table and someone would, someone would just be like this. And they're like, and you're like, what the fuck's going on? He's like, oh, sorry, cobwebs grew on me as you told your story. <laughs> <laughs> and then people would have bits. They like pre-record bits on their phone. Like they would, they would record a second half of the conversation. He's like, oh, I got to get this. No, I can't. And they put it on speaker. No, I can't come home. He's like, you got to come home right now. <laughs> but it's their voice. <laughs> and it's a whole bit. He's like, I'm I'm right here. They're all staring at me. I, can't, I don't care. You worked on that premise. He threw out too many good ideas. Yeah. <laughs> like a whole, like a, the guy did it in the handicap stall or something. Like he did a whole. So anyway, there's some, it helps when there's really funny people in the and room. And the least fun show we ever worked on, which we worked on together, was the Ellen DeGeneres show. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. That was and we heard I heard you and torture. Tom talking about that when it, uh, when it broke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, I think I don't. I mean, I don't never know. You guys what, were kind of right. What What did we say? I yeah, I mean, we, we we see we have these non disclosures, but oh, I, oh, I, I, no. I my take I think was I don't know what my take was, and that's what sucks is I with podcasting is I've said so much shit about so many people, mm -hmm. and I have no recollection, and then all of a sudden you get like a shirt from Dak Shepard and you're like shit did I trash him or did I not trash him uh, right 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 and you're like cuz cuz I like Dak Shepard right I mean and, and then I and then in your head you go I, I know what I think yeah did, what did I say yeah. yeah and then you're like did I say what I think or did I was I what, what like you unfold the shirt are these is this smallpox <laughs> small <laughs> <laughs> I one thing only thing I know I said about Dak Shepard is he doesn't pronounce the word didn't he says didn't huh it's it's a uh, I, it must be regional because he goes, didn't. 
Oh, what a nightmare for you. (laughs) It drives me nuts. Yeah, that's enough to lash out at a major star. Yeah. (laughs) I like Dak Shepard and I like his podcast. His fucking one where he talked about falling off the wagon. Yeah. Was fucking engaging. But, uh, but he, but, and his, everything about him is fucking awesome. I'm, I'm sure I probably said something about, you know, him doing washer and dryer commercials or something. Uh-huh. Right, you know, right, who right. knows what I fucking said? But with Ellen, I can't remember. I think we were just, I don't know what we said. No, though. you were, because in, in my, this is my view, maybe not Greg's, but I really think, let, you know, listen, all talent are tricky. They're humans. So there's, they're multidimensional and, and sometimes unpredictable. And in entertainment, sometimes way more so than your average Joe. But I think, uh, God, how much can I say? But I think they created a monster there. I think. Uh, well, I think is I, my. I think my take might have been. I don't really blame Ellen that, a, that as much as maybe people. You insulate someone, and then, and then you know, I, it happened. It would happen to me just in the cabin, and not even. Yeah. But it was like the you couldn't say like. No, like it, it was almost like separated, and you're like, oh, I don't give a shit. You can come talk to me, right? So, I don't care at all, right? Like, well, we wanted to know if you'd want a cigar. I was like, I definitely want a fucking yeah, cigar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And you no, just you're the me- most. You're one of the most. I mean, and this is not news to any of your listeners. Easily one of the most, the most approachable, and people like you who I've seen who are cool like that, rightly so, get frustrated at people like me who are like. No, what? Wait, we're doing it this way all because you w- were waiting for me to come in tomorrow morning. I'll come in early. Like, yeah. in other words, you find out that all this dance is going on to protect you. Yeah, and I don't need it. I don't right. need it. I, I would rather just. I would rather get everyone in and out as quickly as possible. Yep. Make it as least work for everyone. I remember there was a point on the cabin, uh, and I, I don't know if I should say this, but I'll say it. I remember there was a point in the cabin where I'm naked on the floor, <laughs> and I'm my, and I'm waking up with a glass of wine and there's a assistant camera operator and there's a female and she's uh loading a camera is your dick covered or you're literally naked? i'm on my stomach right now i'm yeah. talking to her but i get up i get up and go to the next room and i said so when you <laughs> i said so when you signed up for the show and i'm on my stomach like you know hands when you sign up for the show what do they do like they like have you signed something? So yeah. like, go, Hey, you'll be saying male nudity. And she looked at me, she goes, I was told this was comedians in cars getting coffee. <laughs> I go, oh. <laughs> That's the best. I was like, okay. She goes, this isn't what I signed up for. Oh, and I go, you're not upset, are you? She goes, no, I don't give a shit, but this is definitely not the show I signed up for. And I was like, I was like, we haven't even put coffee on my ass yet. Coffee went up his ass. <laughs> oh. How about you're laying on the bear rug and uh Bobby, Bobby arrives and uh <laughs> within seconds he's naked with Bert, both naked. And and I remember saying, and you see a bunch of people just all like looking sheepish, all the crew walking around. And I'm like, uh, on the over under on Bobby getting naked, who had six seconds? <laughs> Because we all had an over under. All I saw was people just switching over money in the back. Camera guys put their camera down. Yeah. Bobby was naked quicker. You know what story I, I've been Wait, trying Bobby to tell? Bobby who? Bobby Lee. Bobby, Bobby Kelly. Lee. Bobby Bobby Kelly. Lee, no, Bobby yeah. Kelly. Bobby is better. <laughs> the better story is Bobby Kelly. Well, you wouldn't see his dick, so it's safe. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever told a story to someone? And I always do this yeah. where I, I met, I just say that I'm telling the story so quickly, I say the wrong name. And then, and then it makes it a very different story. Yes. And I, I told my wife one time <clears throat> I was trying to get a bathing suit. My sisters lived on the Starbucks on Detroit and Wilshire. They lived above that Starbucks. Mm-hmm. And so one morning I'm, it's like seven in the morning and I have to get my bathing suit. I have to go shoot something. So I pull up, I pull up. It's kind of a one way street, but I pull up, you can do a little U-turn there. And I kind of double park. <clears throat> and I just for my sisters to throw down my bathing suit. And in doing this, I don't really realize it, but a guy comes up in a teal BMW and is pissed that I'm kind of taking up two spots when he just has to park a little further away. And I hear him just zoom, 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 zoom. And then I get my bathing suit. I don't even realize what's going on. I pull up to that stoplight and he gets out and he starts talking shit to me. And he, I thought it was Louis CK. That's what I thought it was. So I was like, oh, wait, maybe it's Louis. And I'm going to say hi. In the story, I told my wife it was Louis Anderson. <laughs> I go. So this guy, he looks just like Louis Anderson, comes out. 
<laughs> she's like, what? She's and I was like, and I'm like, I'm like, I'm not afraid of the guy, but he's a big guy. And she's like, you can beat up Louis Anderson in her head. And I go, and we start talking shit. And I go, that's right. Go in there and fucking act like a fucking man. I, it was a fucking really intense story. It's the last almost fist fight I ever got into. Wow. And um, and then I didn't I didn't tell the story like till like a month later. I'm telling the same story to someone. And my wife goes, you said Louis Anderson. And I was like, oh, no wonder that was a, <laughs> oh, that's you know, a for super you. aggressive <laughs> car revving Louis Anderson. You know, the guy that fits into a little BMW. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> He's changed. By the way, did you describe it as teal? Did teal. You? Yeah, it was a teal, teal. teal BMW. Is He's that from, a word you use a lot? He's from Florida. You know what? Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I saw lots of teal. Yeah. Wait, wait. I might be using the wrong word again. Yeah. It's the whole what story. What color is teal? Is this teal? No. No, it's like it, a blue. Yes, yeah, but it was teal. It yeah. was teal. It was teal. <laughs> you had that big set of Crayolas when you yeah. were a kid. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> I bet it was a teal BMW. And then, uh, and that day, that this is a bizarre side story. That day, I face fucked uh, Michael Ian Black, sexually harassed Greg Luganus. And I uh, got kicked off uh, the reality show. Something's uh, reality bites back. Those names no. are all, all accurate. In one. Yep. Those names are all very accurate. Was it Greg Fitzsimmons? It was Greg Fitzsimmons. <laughs> no, I was, I was flirting with Louis, with Greg Luganus. I was flirting with him to, cause it was a reality show. And I thought that would, you know, get some, <laughs> some sway. And then he found out I was straight and, and was upset and was oh. like, Oh yeah. He was like, you, you at the board table. He's like, you were flirting with a with a man with no intention to follow through cultural appropriation yeah probably wow and then uh, and then i got kicked off and i was embarrassed and so to try to make up for my embarrassment of getting kicked off a reality show i got naked got on a board table and face fucked michael and black and laid in bed that night going i have ruined my career <laughs> i have ruined greg you see this more than flirting yeah, <laughs> it was you, Greg, not Greg. You thought I was flirting with you? Wait till you see what I do to him. I mean, I put my feet on the back of his chair and pulled it to my dick, and he was like, "I mean, I guess theoretically you could say this is the Me Too story." I'm telling you, <laughs> totally. ruin your career. You were launching it. Bert. I was launching it. Oh, thank God, Michael Ian Black laughed. Thank yeah. God. At the very end, I did a backspin and stuck it. <laughs> And and on the table, naked, and yeah. Michael Ian Black laughed. And if he hadn't laughed, it would have just been bad. Yeah. But he laughed. And I was like, yeah. I was always wondering if he generously laughed. Like if he was like, oh, he's tried really hard. I'll give it to him. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where cancel cancel culture is headed. I mean, I get it just keeps getting worse, right? I mean, the, yeah, the Cuomo so stuff, as you pointed out he's Italian. The guy talks with his hands. Like, like, I don't know if anything worse has come out about Cuomo and I have to watch what I say. Of course it's bad. Because yeah, because when this, that's the other part is like when this airs, if what, like Tom and right. I backlog podcasts. And so we talk about fucking Meghan Markle day of, and then two weeks later, we're like, Oh, didn't know everyone felt that way. Right. Then, right. Yeah. No, I think it's uh with Cuomo. Yeah. He's Italian. There's a, there, <laughs> that's just, that's not a charge. <laughs> that's a that's a result on ancestor dna yeah but um i showed by the way i showed my girls did you ever see the italian restaurant sketch on snl where they're kissing her and they're basically got her surround humping her like a bella ciao bella let's get a zucchero and like and it's just it's just an italian restaurant yeah. sketch and i'm like i'd love to be in a writer's room now if someone pitched that like does that like is that just laughed out of the room Hey, I want to do a sketch. And it was everybody. It was like Dana Carvey. Uh, Farley was the bartender acting Italian. And like Mike Myers and like every every home run hitter was in this sketch. Yeah. Could and they not do that? Or I don't here's know. the other question. Are the kids now so, so woke that they would be like, that they would be blinded. They, they blind themselves from what an Italian person might behave like. Where they're like, I, I don't know. I've never heard that Italian people do that. You know, yeah, yeah, like, right. Huh? Yeah. Well, I rem I remember I took my my mom and my sister to Little Italy for dinner. This is a few years ago, and we had this goomba guy from the Bronx who was clearly milking his Italian persona. Oh, I follow a couple of those guys on Instagram. Oh yeah. Yo, this guy Lizzo. This guy fucking Lizzo is I I I laugh so hard, and my daughters don't find it funny. They're like, Dad, it's what is he doing? Is that isn't that racist and i was like no 
people actually talk like this. And he was like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. He right, is like, he doing an impression, right? Yeah, an insensitive impression, right? Yeah, they're like, that, that, no one talks like this. Listen to this guy. This is what he sounds like, okay? Hang on. Oh, now you know. You know what I'm saying? Brooklyn, baby. Oh, Esposito's pork store. Oh, I know that guy. guy. Yeah, I love yeah, this yeah, guy. Yeah, that guy's great. I saw him go to the Puerto Lil Rican. Mo. Did you see when he went to the Puerto Rican Day Parade? No. It was fucking genius because the Puerto Ricans didn't know what to make of him. By the end, he's he's the king of the party. They're he's, all surrounding him. He's just him. fucking awesome. Yeah, he's I amazing. get a kick out of him. I, I followed him because my buddy Crime Faces like, reposted him. Yeah. And then I was like, I, and I get a kick. I played it. My daughters didn't know what to make of it because they've never, for them, they think that's a guy making fun of people. Right, right, right. Right, of course. Not realizing... He's a person. Yeah. yeah. Like in that, and that I, I get very lost with my daughters when it comes to what they get offended by. Cause I go, hold on. Th that's a real human being. Yeah. That's who he is. Like you just haven't, you've never been to that area yeah. of the world. So you don't know that he's not, would you think he was making fun of people? And they're like, yeah, no, like Jersey Shore is an international phenomenon. Not because they wrote jokes or produced bits. They just rolled cameras on Italian people from New Jersey. <laughs> that was enough. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. And it was genius. Yeah. I wonder if one day they'll look at me and they're like, he's culturally appropriating a dumb fat guy. <laughs> and I'm like, no, that's who he is. No, that's really who he is. Just watched uh, The Sopranos pilot or first episode. And my Sophie, my oldest, and uh, daughters are the exact same age. Your two are the exact ages of my two daughters. And Louis are the exact same ages also. It's really kind of crazy. Anyway, just started watching Sopranos with the oldest a little bit. And first of all, Sopranos starts and it cuts to the open. And uh, it's him driving around Jersey with views in New York. And then there's the World Trade Center. I'm like, oof. And she goes, uh, so every time we see the World Trade Center, you're going to go, oof. And I'm like, I think that's <laughs> I think that's what's going to happen for the rest of us. Because it's like, it's in Friends. And, and she notices yeah. every time I see it, I'm like, oh. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, there's friends. And also the mom. <laughs> Two things didn't age well in Sopranos. The World Trade Centers and the mom. So- <laughs> she um she by the time we get to the end of the first one i'm not kidding you there were like four like dads like because yeah. they're making the most racist jokes yeah i mean it's the, it's exactly what you're saying it's these like you know, goombas i mean they even use that word like sitting around eating prosciutto and like you know and just talking shit yeah. about other nationalities yeah. and she's just like what i'm like no this they've captured i go this isn't one of the best shows of all time because like these are accurate portrayals the show is not defending them yeah, you know, no, it's, like, it's like it's like Archie Bunker. You know what I mean? But the episode where the daughter has a black boyfriend over, and you see Tony walk in the door, I literally <laughs> had to go. I'll have to watch this later. I'm not ready for what's about to happen. And it was, and then when I watched it, it was worse than I had even imagined. Do you remember that? No, I've never seen Sopranos. Oh my Sopranos. God. Meadow leaves the room and then he lays in with some fucking racist stuff to the black kid. Really? Yeah, it was. It was heavy. It was really oh, intense. And, and it was one of those moments yeah. where you go like, look, we can be charmed by this Italian persona, but don't forget, there's an ugly underbelly. It was the same thing when they did the, the Columbus Day episode. I didn't see the Columbus Day. Although I did watch Columbus Day live film from Philadelphia on Instagram, and that was pretty aggressive. <laughs> oh, yeah? Oh, just re regular old Philadelphia. Oh, yeah. just Philadelphia, yeah. oh, man. fucking Phil. Right. I love, I love, I, 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 why is it? Was it, wait, tell me about the Columbus Day episode. Oh, but it was it was about how protesters were upset about the Italians and and their rea <clears throat> their reaction to the protesters and then going down there with bats. Yeah, I think that's are you talking about the Philly one or the Sopranos <laughs> one? <laughs> the made up one or the thing that happens every single day a little south of Jersey? <laughs> well, what's wrong with it that like is it is it because I'm is, am I getting old that I that I enjoy characters meaning like characters that are flawed like characters that are flawed yeah like when i listen to a hip-hop like fat joe made a comment in one of his songs that was uh politically insensitive to asians i go yeah but he is fat joe like i, I give him like <laughs> yeah i give him a little leeway where i go he didn't he didn't have the upbringing maybe i had so maybe right i'm not gonna hold no, i'm not saying i'm not gonna hold him to my standard as in some supremacist way but like it's fat fucking Joe. His right. best friend was Big Pun, who died. Like, like Eminem grew up in a trailer park. Like, I can't. Is there no like contextualization for like who people might be? Because my daughters are holding everyone to the same standard, and it's like you, you know you can't do that. Your daughters are also growing up in the loudest echo chamber ever of like woke culture. 
so are mine. And I, I'm a little and worried mine. about it. Yeah. Like there, I'm like, yeah. it's hard. And I can't even say anything. I'm hesitating now, even on a podcast saying, cause it's hard to say like, you're going to have to learn to roll with, I'm not saying accept it, but like, you're going to stop in your tracks when there are flawed people out there and you can't like, and good luck teaching them. You know what I mean? Like, I don't even know what to say to them. No, it's well, you're right. Is that what kills me is I go, mm. Hey, I'm, I'm putting you out in the world. Like just so you know, when you Georgia 16, when you get in the car and you drive to golf practice, not everyone that is driving in a car next to you is as um uh going to golf practice is going to golf practice (laughs) there may be non-white people too (laughs) and they don't hold the same standards you do with decency (laughs) like they're like i'm writing a bit about it now but they're we got into a big conversation about catcalling because they're like oh we get catcalled all the time and i was like where and they're like anywhere and i was like not anywhere like where and they're like in the neighborhood and i was like bullshit wait your daughters are saying they get catcalled it's they're also you know sometimes they also fudge reality to fit their agenda yeah yeah. in my opinion yeah yeah, yeah. we're we're, and and then and then when the reality doesn't quite match up when when the fudge reality reality doesn't match up to their politics they then refudge it so like they said i'm i want to turn this into a bit so i don't want to get too into this but but they said they get catcalled them and a friend said they get cat all the time and we're like where and the one friend said ventura and we were like well don't walk around ventura like don't what the fuck like that's obvious okay yeah, yeah that's gonna happen you can't you can't stop that from happening and they're like what do you mean i go people are gonna do it like i it's horrible but that's that happens it yeah. fucking happens and and then and clearly it fucking works like no, no one does shit that doesn't fucking work yeah you know like right. that must appeal to some woman out there yeah where the guy wouldn't do it at all like there's yeah and so she was like they were like uh it happens in our neighborhood too and I, and me and the other dad were like easy we moved to these neighborhoods so you don't get cat called walking down the street and they're mm-hmm. like it happens and we're like who and they're like gardeners and i was like okay give them a pass <laughs> I go, I go, what you just said is, what you just said is Mexicans cat call you. And they're like, that's not what we said. That's not what we said. And I was like, no, that's what you right. said. Yeah. Like, how many white gardeners have you ever seen in our neighborhood? Yeah. I can tell you none. It's the same guy. He does the whole fucking street. Yeah. I'll talk to him. But like, and yeah. they go, that's not what we said. It's not Mexicans. That's not what we said. Because now they feel like they're racist. And they, my daughter goes, a lot of 50 year old white guys cat call us. And I was like, the fuck they do. <laughs> I go that, and my buddy starts going cocktailing him. Show me their house. I'll walk on his yeah. fucking knock to his door right now. If there's a man in my neighborhood cat calling my daughter, watering his lawn, going like, "Hey, sweet tits," yeah, right. I will find that man and we'll have a conversation. Yeah, but fucking, it's a. Good- I think it's an ego booster for. I mean, comes from New York. <laughs> no, I'm I'm fucking serious. If you see a black woman get cat called, it is like. It 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 seems a lot of times like they they this is not gonna come out well. <laughs> well, well this is oh, where Mike oh, usually oh, stops start me. sounding <laughs> questionable. I'm saying when you're in New York City and you see cat calling, it is a it is a court it is a courting. It's just the way people are because it's more crowded, it's more loud, it's more yeah. aggressive. It's I just saw, how people do it. I saw Patrice O'Neill cat calling. Uh, my first night I worked at the Boston Comedy Club, he was cat calling bitches as they walked by. Uh-huh. And I said to him, I said, because I grew I mean, not to sound super white, but like I never, I'd never seen anyone do it. I'd heard of it, you know, like in movies yeah. you'd hear it. I never saw someone actually did it. And I started laughing. And he goes, What are you laughing at? I didn't even know Patrice at the time. Yeah. And I said, Why would you do that? Like that just seems so offensive. Like you got a fucking fat ass. And I was like, Why would you say that to a woman? <laughs> Like, that does not seem like it's appealing. And he was like, fuck off. And I was like, why wouldn't you just talk to him? And he was like, oh, sitting in front, it's Bobby Kelly, Jim Norton, and 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 Patrice O'Neill. Wow. I'm working the door. It's my first day working the door at the Boston Comedy Club. And I go, why wouldn't you just talk to them? Now, mind you, I'm barking. So I'm talking to anyone that walks by. Right. So I'm also loose, okay? A beautiful woman walks by in front of these three guys. I say, hey, you, you look like you've had a really rough day. Why don't I take you and get you a glass of wine? And we can talk about it. And she looks at me. She goes, I'm going to pass. And they start laughing. I don't give a fuck. I, right. just, I don't care about that anyway. Yeah. I'm working. I'm, I got to talk to anyone. I give her a fucking flyer. She keeps walking. Yeah. 
And they're laughing at me. And she turns around. This is my first day working at the Boston. She comes back. She gets comes up. She goes, you know what? I'm going to take you up on that glass of wine. And I said, I was joking. <laughs> she was like, what? And I was like, I, I can't. Like, I just got my dream job working at a door at a Boston comedy club, at a comedy club. Like, I want to be a comedian. Yeah. I can't. And she was like, I, what do you mean? You just asked me to, but that wasn't real. And I was like, no. And now these guys are like, what the fuck? And Patrice is like, I'll take you. And she's like, uh, no, thanks. And left. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, fuck. Yeah. But yeah, that cat calling. This is the joke. I'm going to try to figure this out on the podcast. But this is a joke I told my daughters. I go, I told, like you said, I saw cat calling in New York all my, the whole time I was there. Mm -hmm. It happens. And I said, it works. They go, it doesn't work. I said, no, it does work. There are the guys that do it must have low self-esteem or whatever. They've And they can't really communicate the way I would want to communicate with a woman. If I want to take a woman on a date, I'd say, hey, I'd like to take you out to dinner. I'll pick you up, whatever. These guys have low self-esteem. They don't have a lot to offer. They can't be like, I live in my mom's basement. I hope mm -hmm. she dies. I can take over her Medicare or whatever. They So they just go, hey, you want to suck my dick? And the girl's like, it's like a Hail Mary pussy pass. And they're, and they're like, it doesn't work, dad. I go, it doesn't work to you. But there is a woman out there with equally low self-esteem. I go, this is the analogy. I think this is a good analogy. I go, you ever go fishing? Have you ever take your phone and angle it at the water so the sun hits the water off your phone and hope the fish jump in the boat? And they're like, no. I go, you ever put a hook in the water? And they're like, yeah. I go, doesn't work all the time, does it? I go, I bet when that hook enters the water, there's a lot of fish going, that that hook feels threatening to me. <laughs> I don't I don't feel safe with that hook in the water. I go, but there's one fish going, fuck it, I'll suck that hook. <laughs> I go, that's why they do it. <laughs> and my daughters are like totally offended by what yeah. I said. Yeah. And I was like, fuck it. Like it clearly it worked. It doesn't work for me. <laughs> oh. But it's not always, hey, you want to suck my dick? I mean, it's a lot of times, hey, baby, you're beautiful. Yeah. You know, let, let me holler at you. And then I, and then they stop and it starts a conversation. I just think that there's a there's a level of being offended by it that has changed. I'm going to take it to the next level. I'm going to I'm going to put this on the table and this is now this is going to be a tad bit meta and I have to tell you that um the the beginning of this premise was brought up by a drunk Sherrod Small. Okay? okay? So he pointed this out drunkenly in passing Never worked it as a bit, but I find this to be brilliant, okay? Isn't the offense of catcalling truly just a reaction to, um, to uh, what, what's it called when white people move into black neighborhoods? Gentrification. Gentrification. He said, you know, and Sherrod had pointed this out. He said the same, it's, this, is, this is still a form of racism. This, by the fact that you're offended by the way I behave as a black man, is is a form of racism because you're saying i'm white you need to behave white uh -huh. it works for him i'm by yeah, the way yeah, sherrod's yeah. like sherrod's like easy bird let me say my own points right this is what i remember and he said and he said the name emmett till emmett till got killed for quote unquote cat calling uh -huh. and i was like motherfucker if that's not right. an insane way to look at it yeah to go like and 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 i and i, I i've said it to sherrod like four times like you got to work that out as a bit i would love to work that as a bit i would yeah. love that yeah because it's great, such a great premise right. but you go yeah that, that it is it is a reaction to gentrification of of that these neighborhoods that had a, a thumbprint and an ethnicity and a, and a and a and a family and a culture all of a sudden when my, white people start moving in they're like no you need to now change over to us right right I love when I, I wish I, I'm, by the way, Sherrod's going to be like, hey, man, don't ever try to fight one of my premises again. <laughs> He's like, that's not what I meant. But it's also class because clearly a lot of white guys are doing it, you know, on the construction sites. Sure. In fact, in New York, that's all. Oh, that's the not, image it, I have. Oh, it's not a black white thing. It's, yeah. it's cross cultural. It's more of an urban rural. But the thing. point is still there, though. It's definitely class. You and know it's proximity. I mean? yeah. You're right about proximity. It's like, how was I ever going to cat call anyone in my cul de sac? Like no one came <laughs> yeah. through there. Yeah. So like maybe if there was a lot of foot traffic by my house. Yeah. Right. You got to stand out. You need a brighter lure for somebody yeah. to suck the lure. Suck the lure. <laughs> I like that was the what's the one part of the bit that's working in my head. Yeah. Is uh is off. I got suck that hook or whatever. <laughs> and then I have. No, another. that's good. Yeah. yeah. Guys, I didn't know this was a parenting podcast, but. Uh... <laughs> 
Do you remember cat calling New York? Do you remember when uh, Alex, my girlfriend in New York, moved from Texas? He had the hottest girlfriend in New so York. So she uh, goes to work the first day. First day there, she comes back. She's like, this guy on the street. I'm like, oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> here we go. And she's like, he said I looked fine. Like, and, and she was flattered, like to your guy's point. Totally true story. I'm like, wow. So I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, he, he like, he elaborated. He's like, you're like a perfect American girl or wh whatever it was. I'm like, and it, it really was a compliment to her and all this total stranger on the street next day. And I know you remember this because your girlfriend and my girlfriend used to hang out and you definitely heard about this next day comes home before the door even closed. She's like guy on the subway. I'm like, Nut. <laughs> what did he say? Gorgeous hair. It's like jerked off in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that's a standing ovation of cat calling. <laughs> I was like, meanwhile, I was like, you know, I was like, same guy. Same guy. <laughs> Clearly, he'd been thinking about you since yesterday, uh, and totally true. She was, and it was, it was on the way to work. It was, it was in the morning. It was like. It's like I'm totally picturing it just happened. She's still thrown. Uh, Unbelievable. She made it through a day of work. Homeless guy sitting across from her, started grabbing herself, grabbing herself. And then she's trying to avoid it. She, all, she's like, I know you said don't make eye contact and all that stuff. And then took himself out and was playing with him right wow. in front of her and was traumatized. Wait, I know you said what you coached her on this possibility happening no i'm just like listen this isn't you know your rich suburb of houston or your your ranch in austin she had both and i'm like i'm like don't make eye contact especially a good looking woman i'm like try not to make eye contact and don't get too thrown by the bodies you have to step over like i was just trying to like give her the fast yeah. you know catch up to manhattan yeah yeah and uh, and just not to get traumatized that's why when she came in day one like a guy on the street i'm like oh god it happened already and then day two was the guy playing with himself. Wow. But you catch up fast, sadly. Human behavior, like, you know, out, you know, tourists in New York kind of catch. All of a sudden, it's like, oh, okay, this is the thing. Yeah. Wow. Drugs, it's, it's, drugs for me was weed. I didn't know that people would, like, I didn't know that if you didn't ignore them, you were all of a sudden in a drug transaction. Like, when you'd walk right. to Washington Square Park, and they'd be like, smoke? And I'd be like, oh, what's that? Oh, no, I don't smoke. And they'd be like, no, no, no. And then come up on you and yeah. be like, Smoke, what do you want? What do you want? And I was like, oh, I, I could go for some marijuana. Um, Hold on. And then all of a sudden, I bought like nine bags of weed. And I'm like, okay, I got to just ignore them. Yeah, but I nine bags of oregano. <laughs> yeah. It's, no, they are incredibly natural salesmen. I mean, they see the crack. They know how to get in there. They know how then now you feel you owe them to get out of the conversation even. Like they're, they're a, no, it's I've just always human said, nature. If I, if I worked for Merck, I would go to Washington Square Park and I would get drug dealers and have them sell a different drug. These are heart medications, same fucking style, yeah. same salesmanship, same hours. I mean, I used to live on 25th and 9th and it was in the projects and it was all like, it was all projects straight up for me. And there was drug dealers that, lived, that were on the corner. These dudes were there from seven in the morning until midnight, same guys yeah. working the whole, you know, they, they had a fucking work ethic. Oh, it's why, that's why all those, I mean, when you hear the story of like Jay Z and Fifty Cent and all the, I mean, I think you're, you get a business mind when you when you're forced. Yeah. I have friends that, that it's not drug dealing, but like I have a buddy Hutch who just at an early age had to pay for things. Like that was he had too many brothers and sisters, and his dad's like, yeah, no, you, if you want it, you get it. And the way his brain worked was always money first. Like he had a fish tank, and then he just thought, I bet if I put a I put a, I'll tell my buddies, I'll get them a pack of now and later, and I'll put a shot glass in the fish tank. If you can get a quarter in that shot glass. I'll go buy you now and later. And the, like that, he did that. And he just racked up money. Kids in the neighborhood just love gambling. Yeah. And all, all of a sudden he has like, a wall of balloons yeah. and water guns. <laughs> His fish are floating at the top of the tank from all the fucking dirt coming off the coins. Three softballs. Try to knock down my sister. It's <laughs> a <laughs> carny in his cellar. No, but I, are you guys, I'm constantly impressed with like, whether it's Sopranos or I just watch New York versus the mafia, wherever that documentary is like the work ethic is there. Yeah. Like they don't have to, there's not going to be, well, I guess they do have a boss who would scream more than scream at them, but like there's just a drive and they're out there and they don't have to report to an office and they like treat it like a nine to, you know, a lot of them actually, it's like a nine to midnight job. Yeah, I would say they work right? at comic hours where yeah. they just never turned it off. You call them in the middle of the night. Yeah. Like, I, that's what I was always crazy about. Like, we, 
whenever I, like, I remember one time I wasn't drinking for like a month and our friend called in the middle of the night and said their dog ran away and they needed help getting the dog. I had talked about this on a podcast. Dude was a uh, black dude. And he was like, I can't just in the two in the morning, go around with a flashlight and start looking for a dog. Oh wow! I know yeah. it was really kind of an eye opener. And I was like, Oh shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll help. Yeah. I'll help. Yeah. And cause I have no problem. And I, it is when you talk about white privilege, I have no problem getting on a bike with a flashlight, looking around neighborhoods. And if you want to say something, I'll talk to you. And like, and hundred percent, and, and I can, I, do, I would have such a blind spot. to that. Yeah. I would have a yeah. such, and I just, and, but I was sober and I was like, wow, if I'd been drinking, that would be, that's a little different of a story maybe. And I was always like, Oh, I look at these like mafia movies and you get a call at like two in the morning. And I was like, so wait, are there no like full blown alcoholics in the mafia to like get rid of a body at two in the morning? You're like, yeah. oh, fuck a pass out, right. bro. Like these guys have to have crazy fucking hours. Or how about how I'm sure all of us have talked to cops, like just been like, no, no, you fucking, you know, you like stop harassing. Like, I mean, they wouldn't, uh, a black, yeah. I mean, a, generally speaking, a black guy would, would it, and I think there's been bits about this, like, look at you, like, what the fuck are you doing? I'm like, no, fuck this. You know, we're all righteous. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> no, there's uh, 60 minutes last night had on the guy who's now the, uh, the chair, the chairman of the joint chief, chief, chief of staff, chairman of the, uh, armed forces. There you go. He was on, he's black. And he talked about how as a soldier and every black soldier, he knows there is a level of perfection they have to hit just to knock it. The discipline among black soldiers is like 50% higher than white soldiers. Really? And that you have to be perfect. And he said every position he was at, moving his way up through the middle, because he started at the bottom, yeah. he had to be flawless or else you'd get reprimanded. It's like what Sarah said about uh, white comics. She was talking to a white comic and she put this, I'm not, I'm paraphrasing, but it's, it was, she put it on a, on Instagram and he was like, you have no idea how hard it is for a white guy. And she goes, mm, I have I have an idea as a woman right. in comedy. I've had some hiccups. I've had some. And she was like, how about this? You just be perfect. And I think, thank God I got in at the buzzer where you didn't have to be perfect. <laughs> and you could just get in early and fucking cruise. Yeah. Because I don't know if I could be perfect. Oh, we got so fucking lucky, the yeah. three of us. <laughs> I mean, it's like when I see all this, all this like, uh, you know, woke affirmative action for women and men and transsexuals and everybody else. I just think, holy shit, man, we had it good from forever until millions four of years. years ago. Yeah. Forever. Mill millions of years. Yeah. Yeah. Till like 14 months ago. <laughs> yeah. 14 months ago. Right. And now it's like, all right, I guess I, I should wait a little while till I get too angry about it. <laughs> I can I can and live you, off of the profits of my entitlement. You're grandfathered in, which, by the way, is a racist term. Did you know that? Why? It's uh, you can keep your slaves. You're grandfathered in. I'm 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 generalizing. That's that's no it. shit. It's, it's derived from that. Oh, I'll tell you a phrase that uh, that is not racist. Well, it could be. I don't know. Uh, okay. <laughs> I just said something totally horrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it. Uh, my wife says it all the time. Wait one cotton pick a minute. Oh. It, well, you assume okay. that it's racist, obviously, because of the connection between how p cotton was picked. It, in fact, and it may still be racist, but it, in fact, when I looked it up, it says it wasn't. It was that cotton picking is a very tedious task. Mm -hmm. So if you were to cotton pick for one minute, it would feel like a longer minute. It would oh, feel like a longer minute. Oh, I got minute. it. And that's why so blacks are say, always late. Got <laughs> it. Got it. Got it, Bert. I see what you got. It's so, like, <laughs> like I would say, wait one uh, rowing minute. It would be like, wait one treadmill minute. Or, yeah, you know, yeah. like something you don't like to do that would take longer. One ice bath minute. One ice bath minute, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take one hand job on the beach at two in the morning minute. <laughs> I used to wear, I've written on a lot of black shows. That's yeah. my thing for some reason, because I'm the whitest human being in America. <laughs> and one of them had, uh, they, they had a clock up on the wall that had the time in the writer's room. And then there was another clock next to it that said CPT on it. And it was an hour <laughs> behind it. And I thought you could never fucking have that up right now. Oh, no, 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 you no. You should probably explain to, to some of the viewer, listeners who don't know what you're talking about. What Cape CPT Town. Means? Cape Town. Is it Cape, Cape Town? Town. Cape, it's Cape Town. Town. It's Cape it's Town. Cape Town. It's Cape Town. Okay. The people that know, no. <laughs> this podcast is brought to you by Liquid IV. When you push your body hard or just feel run down, it is so important to stay hydrated. Hydration should be a priority. It helps you feel healthier. 
on a day-to-day basis. And with one stick of liquid IV in 16 ounces of water, you get two to three times faster and more efficient hydration than water alone. My day starts every morning with a 5 a.m. run. I, I drink a little coffee before that, and that dehydrates me. After I'm trying to sweat out the impurities, people. We know that. But it's so important for me to stay hydrated through the day. In the middle of my day at noon, I pop a liquid IV. I'm telling you, it is it is all I, my body is asking for. They've got lemon, lime, acacia berry, uh, passion fruit, guava, watermelon, apple pie. Contains five essential vitamins, more vitamin C than an orange, and as much potassium as a banana. Note artificial flavors, preservatives, less sugar than an apple. They have clean ingredients, non-GMO, vegan, gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free. I'm telling you, it's the optimal, optimal ratio of glucose, sodium, potassium, and delivers water and nutrients into the bloodstream. My bloodstream is so important. For me, I notice that when I stay hydrated, my blood pressure is lower. That's what I've noticed. Grab your Liquid IV in bulk nationwide at Costco, or you can get 25% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use the code BERT at checkout. That's 25% off anything you order when you get better hydration today. Use the promo code BERT at liquidiv.com. I remember going on radio shows in like, uh, in, uh, in like probably early 2000s and just, I mean, just re- some radio shows would just be so outwardly racist. Yeah. And you just go in and cosign. Just you, like there was no, yeah, right. like the last thing you wanted to do was try to fucking, no one was virtue signaling then. Right. You yeah. were just like, sure, whatever you guys want, yeah. whatever sells me tickets, whatever your fans want, I'll, 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 I'll bring it this weekend. Yeah, right. It's fucking crazy. I was saying to someone, the amount of fucking shit I've cosigned in an Uber, just driving in a car with an Uber, the guy's like, guy's like, uh, man fucking women right bro and you're like oh yeah sure whatever you want to say about them just give me five stars yeah 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 what's what is the like what is the size of your audience before you have to kick in and make a stand you know like if it's if there's a group of people that say something you feel like you know you gotta you gotta what do you mean what do you mean like what gavigan did what did gavigan do when gavigan just fucking went off on trump and like, oh, and, right, and you could right. see, you could see like, I, I think fans of his. And he was like, leave. Yeah. Right? And he was like, fuck off. Right. I'll burn it to the ground before I let him become our president. Right. Right. No, I guess I just mean like critical mass before you have to speak up. Like if it's, if it's one uncle and he's in his seventies and you're at a family get together and he says the N word, you kind of go like, well, not changing uncle Paul. Right. And right. I'm not going to go out of my way to do it. But then if you hear somebody else say it, maybe in public and there's African-Americans around, then do you step in? Like, what's the moment you have to decide whether or not to take a stand? So, I have jokes that play with race yeah. and in a way that there's a context. I'm clearly being ironic. And if I do something about black people and there's no black people in the crowd, that's when it's awkward. Oh, if, totally. I'm the same exact way. You need the yeah, black yeah, people yeah, in yeah. the crowd to, to let them know that we're all on board. Oh, I yeah, I, I would... I would never, I had a joke, I had a joke a long time ago about being in an airport. I never put it on a special, being in an airport bar and a black guy said something racist to me and I laughed. And then I was, and and the part of the joke I, I, I liked, which I, which, which I thought was interesting or a good take was, um, I laughed and then I was like, wait, was that a test? Like how, and then, and then he laughed and I was like, wait, how does he know? He just knows that I'm racist now because I laughed at that racist joke. Mm-hmm. But has he know my racism stops at Middle Eastern people? Uh. <laughs> like, what if I mean I'm I'm not a cafeteria racist. If you're racist as you're white, we created it. We hate we hate <laughs> them all. Yeah. And I said that to him in the joke. And then and then uh, I would have guys, white guys come up to me after the show and be like, just so you know, my racism doesn't stop either. And you were like, Oh, that was not my intention. <laughs> oh, yeah. And no. you're like, okay, never telling that joke again. Like, I think I'm getting the wrong people. But there was a like, it's interesting because I I uh, what am I talking about? You must have a lot of the, and this is a tough thing for you to talk about. But just from the region you're from, you you have a lot of fans. I'm sure who I mean, I guess every all you have fans that you can't agree with on everything. But you must run into that a bunch. Yeah, I don't. I, I you know I end up. I think because I don't really when I was younger, and I, when I was about to say this when we were when I was younger when we were younger. I felt like 
you chances with race were much bigger swings and you'd see it at the improv all the time some of my favorite comics would take really big swings at it and hit it out of the park yeah I mean, it was so commonplace mm -hmm. and 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 then i just until recently i noticed it definitely started kind of dis dissipating and i and i at a certain point when i worked at travel channel mm -hmm. i stopped i had one joke that bob that it bothered me that it was misinterpreted and i and it was a uh, it was such a stupid fucking joke but i said the premise was do you want to hear something really racist they don't make black baby powder it's just a stupid joke right obviously <laughs> but but i miss said it in that you want to hear something really racist it triggered someone who was waiting to be outraged and right this yeah. this black woman didn't hear the rest of the joke which they don't make black baby powder they they just make white stuff how insensitive when a black guy gets harassed he's got to ghost ride the whip right like and <laughs> and then and then they should make eight shades of ba black baby powder i learned uh -huh. that on a documentary not a documentary it was tyra but i <laughs> i i put it on that uh they, and call it magic johnson and johnson's right that was a joke <laughs> yeah it was a joke yeah. And this woman got outraged. Outraged. She didn't hear the whole joke. She she just heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to hear something? Real? And she um, tried to get people to protest my show at the Dayton Funny Bone. Wow. And I got and 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 then turns then, into sold out three months straight. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know that's the thing. Yeah. You know, you get Sorry, people I... that are trying to co op that energy now that are going like they used to be. I'm not going to mention names, but there's certain comedians that were edgy, but but that I laughed at because again there was context. And then all of a sudden they found this group of people that was liking them for the wrong reasons and yeah. their careers were struggling. So they kind of embraced it and yeah. they went all in. And now they're like, have big crowds of the wrong people. I've seen Nick DiPaolo's podcast. Nah. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, what's crazy is like, what's crazy is I am a, like, I'll use Nick as an example, but like Nick's very political right now. I don't know that side of him really. Like I just know him as a great comic. He's a great comic. A great comic. Yeah. And had him on uh Something's Burning and someone at my my cookie show and someone said to me like uh why would you give him a platform? And I was like, what are you talking about? I was like he's one of the best he was, he's with Colin Quinn. They were both on Tough Crowd. Mm -hmm. We like he was friends with Patrice like I, and I didn't but you do see people go People do take an angle on politics because, you know, maybe that's their politics or maybe they find a fan base that is that way. And you just go, I mean, I don't know, to each his own. But I still think Nick DiPaolo is fucking hilarious. Yeah. The yeah. same with Corolla. You know, there's a lot of like why he was on the roast, which I was doing. And they're like, why are you giving him, you know, like real sort of outrage? That oh, yeah. No, there's a lot of comics that won't. I'm on his show tomorrow. I still do it. I, I had him on my show. Politics. I had him on my show yeah. the other day. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's like, what? where's the dialogue? Like, if he says shit on his show, I don't agree with. I lay into him and yeah. he lays into me and that's fucking, that's what comedy should be. That's what yep. entertainment should be. That's what politics should be. He had a great take. I said to him, I asked him, how do you come up with your ideas? Like how vetted are your ideas? Sometimes he'll take an idea and really run with it. Mm -hmm. And there are ideas he said that I'm like, that I just am like literally like I'm staring at a wall going, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And then, and some of them are, I'm like, that's a really good fucking point. And he goes, yeah, that's interesting, Bert. And then he told me how he kind of vets ideas and he was talking about COVID numbers yeah. in, in Africa and, you know, you know, initial instinct. And then they found out the, the lifespan and the average age, the median age in Africa is like 19. I think I'm paraphrasing. I'm sure that's right, not accurate, right. but he was like, and then you find out that the reason COVID isn't crazy in Africa is because people aren't as old as they are in America. And you're like, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. so, but yeah, I, I, I wish I I sometimes think that I might be a bad person because I don't get outraged at all. Mm. Like, I don't like. I had a professor in college, actually a famous one, this guy, Neil Postman, who wrote Amusing Ourselves to Death and All. And at one point, he just started this class and he's like, What could I say that would offend any of you? And he's like, I'm not talking about like, oh, a little like, oh, that's rude or that's racist. He's like, I'm like saying, What if I like threw your flag on the ground? We're all like, meh. <laughs> it was at NYU. Yeah. And we're like, he's like, do you know his, like for centuries, how that would like, th there was a principle like symbols. He was talking about a symbol drain and he's like, symbols used to have such power. He's like, what if I offended your God? And the whole class at NYU was just like, what? And he's like, th he's like that, that was number one. He's like, that used to be number, number one. one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was number one. Like what? Like that is crazy. That Charlie Hebdo. They drew a comic. Of right. 
And, and none of us can understand. I wish I cared about anything as much yeah. as they cared mm -hmm. about drawings of Allah. Like, right. I, I don't care about, there's nothing I care about that I would, that would make me want to hurt someone else or better yet, even cancel someone. Like, I don't like, yeah. I just look at like, and maybe, maybe it's one of those things where I was like, I said to someone, I said to someone about politics, I was talking to a black dude and I was like, I don't really care. I don't really care about politics. I don't really follow it. And he's like, yeah, you got that luxury. And I was like, what's that mean? He's like, well, whoever wins, you're kind of taken care of. Yeah. And I was like, oh, good point. I mm. never saw that. Right. And you, but I don't like, did you see that comics joke today that he got banned from Twitter? No. Please. Right, have, you, have you heard of this? You know, the thing that's going on now, which is really interesting. Look while you're looking at it, like Reddit, like all of a sudden taking the side of something like GameStop or AMC and Reddit being like, no, 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 no. You're not going to, the, the man is not going to sh short GameStop and Reddit and all this. Well, the same thing is happening now with anything that's canceled. The, and I should know his name, the country artist who. Uh, uh, well, come on, come on. Wa Wallace. Who, with the N word. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Number one album, like uh, he was then he, he <laughs> was being <laughs> he was being canceled, and Reddit, and it's not just Reddit. So apologize to your listeners. It's all these um, sort of ways that people could communicate. The Reddits of the world all are like, no, 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 you're not going to cancel him. Opposite, he's going to number one. Mm -hmm. Morgan Whalen. Yep. Mm. Morgan Whalen. Uh, Go buy the album. I'm kidding. Well, I think I think I think his <laughs> fans. See that it, you, they you also thought he was wrongly accused. Yeah, because he, yeah. I, and I'm not I'm not I'm not going to defend him saying the N word, right. but he was saying it to a white guy in a in a kind of like busting his balls kind of way. But he wasn't. It, well, it could have been was, a meta level. I mean, in other words, you know, names we call, we make each other whatever. There's no defending it. But you know, we throw around terms sometimes that are very insensitive. But it's just us. And we're doing it to make the other guy laugh because it's so wildly wrong and inappropriate. And I, I, I didn't see the footage. I'm wondering if that's what that was. There's a the joke, kind of as a joke, or it was just very. Oh, oh no, 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 no. He said it like you, uh, like his friend was too drunk. He's like, man, tell that pussy ass n word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, and gotcha. and he's and his and and then I think, I think what happens in that too is that fans look at the the uh, uh unfairness of how it was captured is his neighbor was videotaping yep. him and his neighbor posted it and i think there is like a i don't know i i think his fans just didn't take offense to the context in which it was used mm -hmm. i've never by the way and I, I don't know if this is the effect anyone wanted but i had never heard of the guy even i had heard of that person that had gotten kicked off snl didn't know it was him it wasn't until he said the m-word that i went and he got, they tried to cancel him that I went, oh, who is this guy? Yeah. And then I was like, oh, wait, he's a country. By the way, I'm not, I'm not approaching him as an artist from like a perspective of I'm outraged. I went, who is he? And then I was like, wait, play one of his songs. I was like, oh, he's not that bad. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I'm found, I'm like, you just introduced me to someone. Mm -hmm. I said, to, I was texting with, uh, I was texting with a friend. You'll know who it is when I, when you see the front, when you see the, when you see the joke. But I said, so. This is the joke. I'm not going to say the guy's joke because if I say it and you laugh, then you could get in trouble. Oh, That's the new thing. Right. So I'll let you read it. It's this one. I'll just hit on the the, the tweet. So, oh, oh, you just reposted it. Okay, the, I just reposted <laughs> it. That's the joke. Okay, I so can't just, read this joke out loud. You 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 can, but uh, just don't laugh because <laughs> it's a good joke. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good joke. <laughs> <laughs> oh god it's a pretty good joke that's right? a good joke it's a great joke yeah all right um there was a there was a uh teen vogue magazine try to picture a more woke publication <laughs> <laughs> okay so there was something in the news yesterday about how this guy had been given the job of the publisher or the editor of teen vogue and then Somebody discovered something that he had said a decade before and they brought it up and they all, all the teen Vogue editors, all these young women in their early 20s got together and they got the guy very publicly humiliated and fired. And then the main girl behind it. Uh, no, no, somebody, no. It was a girl that got fired. Oh, I thought it was a man that no, got fired. No, it's a girl. No, 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 no. I'm saying the girl then. No, 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 no. So what happened was, now correct me if I'm wrong, but this is how I read it. So a 27-year-old girl was going to be the first African-American editor of Teen Vogue, 
right? They cut back to some racist things she had said about Asians. Oh, that's what it is. Right, when right, she was right. 17. Yeah. And the person that was kind of spearheading it was the head of social media for Teen Vogue, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. And she was like, thank God I dot, 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 thank this. You know? I just sighed the biggest sigh of relief that this, yeah. the woman got fired. Yeah. And then you cut back to that exact person who fired the girl, tweeted almost the identical same thing, except about black people. Right. Using the N word. Using the N word. Like four different times. On her Whoa. Twitter. Yeah. You, but you, with the A at the end and saying it to a friend. I get it. Women are the worst. I agree, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, there, there's a, there was a comedian. I won't say her name. So I'm sure she's a very sweet person. But this, what it's, it's this, don't throw a fucking rock in a glass house. Yeah. That's, this is why I don't tweet about anything, about anyone. I fucked up once. I said something about someone on a podcast. I got caught off guard. It was an interview show. They asked me. I tried to play the fence. I tried to like ride the fence and it did not come off that way. And I just felt, I felt bad because I was like, I don't know any of the fucking facts. I'm just spouting off like a comedian. Yeah. So I won't say this girl's name because I'm not throwing rocks. But she came out and was like, slammed Shane Gillis for making racist comments and not getting fired from SNL or getting hired from SNL, right? She comes out and slams Shane Gillis. This is what is wrong with Asian, with jokes, is you need to be cognizant of what you're saying. Asian hate is real. And guys like this promote it. Right. She posts that immediately. There are nine jokes, if not more, yeah. that she has written about Asian people. Uh -huh. And she, you just, she's not, she's unaware. She's unaware that she is, this is my problem with everything. Is she's unaware that she is just as bad a person as Shane. Or not as bad a person. Or, or just, just, just whatever. Right. Is it, right. is it, Shane's not a bad person, but. She's just as bad as what she's claiming him to be. Yeah. I know Shane. I love Shane. He's got some really great. He has a great joke about the Special Olympics that had me fucking crying laughing. And, and, but he's just a comic and then she's just a comic, but she takes this perspective of looking down on him, not realizing yep. she's no better. And, and I, I don't blame her. I've, I've been righteous in my life and made mistakes. I tried not to be righteous or hypocritical, but then Shane, I, all I saw it was on Shane's fucking instagram was uh hey you may want to check your own feed before you start throwing people under the bus mm -hmm. yeah and you're just like no if barack obama has to come out publicly and address this type of thinking do you remember when he made that statement no he was like it makes people feel really good to stand back in the safety of you know behind a computer and knock other people down and cancel other people you need to stop yeah he came out and said that it's 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 crazy because it just I mean, like, look, if you hurt somebody, if you're hurting people, like literally hurting people, I just I don't want to give you my money mm -hmm. as a consumer. And right. I mean, that's not canceling. That's just me not letting people that abuse yeah. people. But fucking. Do you realize jokes? this podcast started with you saying yeah. that people just end up talking so, about well, it's, it's so going on in my news feed. That's the only thing that comes up. Yeah. I, I go into Google News yeah. and it, that's all that I see. But it's not, you know, you can put it in words like woke culture and make it marginalized, but it's not a small thing. We're talking about, you know, cultural censorship at a very high level to where, you know, you this is where political censorship crawls in. You know, all of a sudden you can't, you know, there's a party in power and all of a sudden if you speak badly of them, you can lose your job if the, this type of mentality can carry over into that. It can leak into all of oh. that. And it's, it's for, especially for like when you get, I, I get done podcasts these days and I go, God, did I say, was I like, okay on that? Like I'll say it to Tom all the time. Cause I have no idea what I say on that podcast. Like I'm, I've fucking said some, whore, and then it's just like, Oh fuck. Mm. Well, good luck. Like we were talking on our podcast. We were talking about how this documentary I, it's like I'm exhausted even just thinking about saying it now, but this documentary about Woody and Mia oh boy. was a piece of garbage documentary that was very one-sided. And I was just trying to say like, hey, I was waiting for the one that had the smoking gun that said Woody was a pedophile. And I would have, I am not a Woody defender. And you, it's so hard to separate. And I couldn't, my daughters think I'm the biggest Woody Allen fan creep and I'm like, I am just saying this documentary is irresponsible and they're not really like they, they've left out inconvenient truths, blah, blah, blah. But to 
culture, it's very hard for them to distinguish. Like you're just an apologist. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, yeah. it was really hard to be like, hey, I'm allowed to question this attack on him, which is arguably the worst thing you could call a human being. Like it's, you got to get your ducks in a row. Otherwise, because this is a, he said, she said, and a girl, and all, and all, even now I'm feeling dirty saying this stuff. And all I was doing was criticizing the documentary. And I'm like, listen, if they had given an objective thing, they might've had this money, like who knows? But it's like, now I can't trust this documentary because of all the things you've learned from it. And by the way, and critics, terrified of criticizing. Oh, you couldn't. I mean, I, I've never, I haven't seen it yet, but I probably won't watch it. Was it. Like, it was like well, reviewers are of- the worst because they are, you know, you talk about Hannah Gatsby's one hour special. Oh. If anybody can find <laughs> one fucking funny moment in that, I'll give you a thousand dollars. And there's not a critic that came down against it. Oh, they crazy were so rich Asians? Afraid. Right. A piece of shit movie. <laughs> You know, listen, likable and light, but fucking 98%, whatever it yeah. was on Rotten Tomatoes. I'm like, you're just a, this is the most recycled fucking, you're racist. Yeah. You are racist <laughs> because you're afraid to say, hey, great. There's a lot of Asians in it. Rah, rah, good. Let's move the needle. But the movie, a waste of time. Yeah. And see, I, can I tell you, I, I, I get very lucky. Because I just, I've actually decided. I picked to, the right week to, to criticize Crazy Rich Asians. <laughs> Holy shit. Don't worry, this will air in a couple. Thank this will air in a month. Oh yeah, I'm sure it'll get better. I always introduce. I'm my- sure, I'm sure the Asian thing will <laughs> calm down, Bert, in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> By the way, that was one thing we said on the podcast. I read a headline. I'm like, an Asian community organizes after Atlanta killings. I'm like, am I allowed to say it's going to be very organized? <laughs> I'm like, like, am I? That's a compliment in can, my book. Can we say that it's going to be well documented with photos? <laughs> it's going to be super efficient and really on point. I think. Well catered. Yeah. The food will be. Uh, uh, I said. Uh, I said to my daughters. I said, <laughs> oh, we were eating bun mies, and I go, yeah. "Don't fucking anyone be hate Asian people. Their food is fucking <laughs> awesome." And my daughter. Oh, yeah. Dead. Just because you like Asian food doesn't make you an ally. <laughs> I go, really? She goes, uh, looks me up and down. She goes, I bet you like all races. <laughs> opportunity. Uh, she's either. fat shaming you, Bert. Oh, yeah. Fuck yeah. You should have lit her up. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. my God. <laughs> no, yeah, my I, it's, yeah. it makes an argument for not taking in new information. <laughs> Like, yeah. like I, right. I, I read a book, Bill Berg gave me a book, gave me a book, just like that, fucking, ugh, I get caught up in detail sometimes. Yeah. He recommended a book called Flyboys, and I read one book, this is one book I've read in probably the last 10 years, right, right. and including mine, I didn't even read mine, <laughs> and so I, I, I read it, and then, like, the one takeaway I get is, like, there was a lot of cannibalism, you know, with like American soldiers. A lot of them were eaten by the Asian, sol- by the Japanese soldiers. Yeah. And then that, that's the only tidbit I pulled away from the book. Cause I'm not that intelligent. Yeah. So I don't remember all the other stuff. I just, the, the, the shiny part of the book is the uh-huh. one thing I hold on to. So then any, it's like my wife cringes. If anyone brings up world war two, she goes, Oh, here we go with Bert <laughs> and his fucking agenda. Well, I read a book. Yeah. And she's like, it was one book. And it was like nine guys. It wasn't all of them, Bert. And I'm like, I don't know. I had like a solid 30 pages about it. And so I go. And so my wife goes, you would be better off not reading. Like if you didn't take all the information you have right now, just let's work with that for the rest of your life. Like we don't need new stuff getting in there because yeah. (laughs) have you read Candace Owens? She's like, don't give it to him. Don't give it to him. (laughs) Oh, my God. Don't give me, oh, you've got your talking points. Stick with them, Bert. Yeah, like, hey, you like to party? Give him a beer. Hey, yeah. look who's here, the fun party guy. Yeah, pull the string. Yeah, pull the string. <laughs> Shirt's coming off. Here we go. You talked about not reading your own book. Uh, Joel McHale, who's very funny, was writing his book, and then he was having two super funny guys who who worked on the sitcom I did with Joel. Brad and Boyd, so funny, and they're like his group, and they're the three of them together are so funny. So he'd have them like punch up. You know, hey, can, can this be funnier? This part I wrote in my yeah. book, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, at the point of not reading it, Joel, to his credit, told the story. He's like, so I'm now doing the audio. The book is printed. I'm doing the audio book, and uh, I'm in the middle of a chapter. I'm like, this is in there? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, he's reading, like, things they punch, and either had forgotten it or, like, kind of just sped read it, you know? like, And he's like, uh, oh, all right, this is out there. Okay. <laughs> Sweet. Okay. I'm going to tell everyone about this. Yeah. 
Oh. By the way, what percentage of the people that bought your book, knowing your listeners and your fans, Ooh. what percentage actually read it? Because like somebody was telling me that they used to sell, you know, DVDs like I do on the road. Yeah. And I always wondered like how many of these people actually watch this DVD? And then somebody said they started selling them on digital cards, you know? And you can track how many people watch it. Like 7% of people would watch the special after buying it after a show. Whoa. Wow. Yeah. I would say, well, I mean, I'm, uh, don't forget I can, gifts. A lot of them are gifts. Uh, yeah. I bought Colin Quinn's book, uh, State by State. What is it? Uh, yeah, overstated, yeah. Which I want to get, actually. Yeah. yeah well, you can have them. mine. I'm not going to read it. <laughs> <laughs> He'll only read the 30 pages about Asian people eating people. N nope. I read Florida. I read Florida. And then I was like, not for me. <laughs> no, I, I read Florida. And then I was like, but I, I'll buy books to support people, but I don't, I won't buy them. Like I, I'm just not, I don't enjoy reading. I, I don't enjoy it. I know that I'm sh I should, but I just lay there. And then I, I I'm feel intimidated by reading now. Like the idea, I mean, part of it's ADD, which I don't have that bad, but I definitely have it. And it's like, uh, we sit still for how, how long and, and, and comprehend paragraphs. Huh, that sounds daunting. Yeah, my, my, and my, my, my brain is too active where I start reading and I start telling myself a story. Like in Flyboys, a lot of it's about George W. Bush, George, the first one. Mm -hmm. And he's in it. And you hear his story of like getting shot down. No, over legit the, hero. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're like, wait, in my head, I'm like, did they talk about this when he was going for president? Like I knew he was in the CIA, but I didn't know like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I was like, this is crazy. And then my, I, I'm still reading, but my brain's like, whatever happened to Ronald Reagan? Like he's dead, right? He's gotta be dead. And then I'm like, I should know that. That's something I should know. I was like, wait, is Nancy dead? And then I'm all of a sudden, I'm, I'm, I'm literally, I'm three pages later and I'm all I'm thinking about, Hey, is Ronald Reagan's son, did he get AIDS? Or was that just that his dad ignored AIDS? And I'm not, I'm not, right. but my eyes are yeah. still reading. Yeah. Yes. And so then all of a sudden you can't take anything I read for, like, I can't bring it up at a party. And then, and then I, I'm really bad with facts. So like, I'm listening to this podcast um, called Rev Revolutions. Oh, I've heard all about that. And I, it's on my list. It's so good. Because I think we're heading towards one eventually. It may even be a hundred years, but I think we're definitely heading towards one. Uh, here's how they work. They work in groupings of three. So like from what I've, what I've accrued out of this podcast, and they have like 10 seasons of revolutions. So it talks about the revolutions in South America. If I think there was two in France, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. there was a Austrian revolution, like there's revolutions all over. And uh, I didn't realize anarchists weren't about just chaos. Like I thought anarchists were about chaos. Yeah. It's not about chaos. It's more about like, uh, it's more about, what is oh i'm glad you guys are here you're smarter than me so an a, a, atheist never mind this is fucking point this, <laughs> this is why like this well, should I, be your new I book read, i read this and, it, and i was like it's not about no government but it's tactical there's a purpose yeah, there's a purpose for yeah. anarchy it's not right. like just everyone runs in the street jerking right. off on fucking right. kids that just got to new york it's yeah. like it's there's a purpose to it i can't remember what it is anyway they come in three chunks of three like they that first one is like a shark bump in your leg. That first one, the one we just experienced. Uh -huh. There's going to be another one. And then there's a real one where everyone changes power. And then all those people we slammed that stormed the Capitol, they're our heroes. That is how yeah, that's the how, founding fathers. That's the founding fathers. That's how that's going to work. Mm -hmm. What's the movie we just saw? Judas and the, it's about Black Panthers. Judas and the Messiah. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, he at 20 years old or even not, whatever it was going over to the whites the white racist and being like, right. hey, our enemy is the same fucking, and it, which was an amazing Wait, moment. I didn't see the movie. I didn't see the movie. It's an amazing true story of in Chicago, right? He is this young, really charismatic, smart guy. And he is starting, he immediately goes, I'm going over, you know. I'm, this is after Malcolm X had been assassinated. I'm going Martin over to this white meeting that we know, like, you know, the people that want to kill us, by the way. I'm going to the white meeting because we, we actually have the same common enemy. Like we're, And that is such an echo. And I think it's in almost every revolution, like part of, and it's interesting you say they'll be our heroes. When I'm trying to understand how these brains are working in our country that are so the opposite of mine, it turns out they're not. I think these frustrated Trumpers, for instance, which I'm the, on the opposite end of the spectrum, it's this fucking 1%. 
It's this disenfranchised and Trump spoke to it. Sadly, he chose the racist route and all of that. But it is the same thing that in fucking, and I know it seems bombastic for me to sit here, old white guy saying this, but like I'm enraged at the 1% of the 1% and how it's gone unregulated and fucking hog wild and the middle class has disappeared and the union crushing and all of that. It's like, it's the same thing. We are, we don't, we haven't put it together yet. Will there ever be a leader? Because the, the, the foundation of this, um, division between poor whites and blacks is, you know, post civil war where they basically said we ha we can't let poor people unite against rich people because yeah. they've got the numbers. So they divide and conquer. And now is it possible that somebody can coalesce poor people against because one tenth of one percent of this country owns 50 percent of the wealth is it possible that somebody can reach out and connect and as you to know the bottom 99 percent? it takes nothing it, it, uh, just a switch has to be thrown just people have to walk out of their house and be like we're done and it, and and then that it's that's it yeah the police will run for the fucking hills well, and those people all have guns now <laughs> there is there is more guns than people in this country right now oh yeah and what's crazy is what's crazy to me is when you hear about these revolutions, all of them, all of them sound identical to what happened at the Capitol. The police, like the like the the czar's police, czar Nicholas, yeah. let them in. Oh yeah, he was like, they're like, oh, yeah, uh, we're trying to stop you, we're trying to stop you, and that's what they said happened. Oh wow, I mean, Chappelle said that that isn't what happened at the Capitol. That he had uh, that he said that he had black friends that are cops who were throwing crackers on. But it sounded to me that the that it seemed it sounded what the media said it, that that the police were not being as strict as they should have been with people oh, storming yeah. the Capitol. That's how Rome fell. Wait, did you hear yeah. one guy? Uh, they got the tape on those tapes that they then like had organized. There was audio. It was so easy when they walked in. He goes, "Dude, I think this is a trap. They're going to let us in and lock the doors." And I thought, "Holy, what a jujitsu move that would have been!" Oh, fucking in in. Ooh. You back yeah, up. You with back up. Not with Congress in session at the time in the same building. You gotta have bait in the lobster <laughs> trap. You gotta have you gotta you gotta have bait in there. I said I said to someone I was like, I watched this lady talk about uh, this representative. I don't know who she was. Talk about how scared she was when they were storming the Capitol. And in my head, I I'm very naive in that I go, they were they weren't going to hurt you in my head I, because I I don't know who she is. So I'm like. You know, weren't you guys safe in my head? And then I heard one of them say something about AOC. And I was like, oh, if they had gotten a hold of her, they would have killed her. Like, they, without a doubt, yeah, they would have murdered her. Or which, Nancy Pelosi. It, they would have murdered. And then you're like, oh, this was. And that's when I started changing my, like, not changing, but I was like, oh, this was really real. Like, I didn't realize. Yeah. And that's when I started listening to this thing about revolutions. And I was like, this was an attempted revolution, a, a coup. Where they were trying to yeah. take over and and had they killed a bunch of people that what was like what the fuck like that was yeah. it, it's insane to me but there will be more of these it has to be well That's, it's like robbing a bank it's kind of like you could rob like hey this is a holdup on and if you're caught you're like I was joking it's a joke it's a joke but if it works you're taking that fucking money <laughs> yeah yeah like. Well, that's what they're trying to decide right now is with, with the people they've arrested, which is hundreds now, is whether or not you're charging them with trust. This is a lot of ways you can prosecute this. The highest level is sedition, which is what you're saying, which is overthrowing the government, which is, you know, I don't know what to charge for that. That's got to be, you that's know, is, I thought it was in death. jail. Or something. Uh, there's treason, isn't that treason? Should be, as far as I'm concerned. Kill them. I mean, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you, I mean, the, 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 here's, let's, if we're, if we're being devil's advocate yeah. for my guy who's, Listen to every season of Mike Duncan's podcast. The kind of the, the thing they did in the past. You can't send them. So so uh, uh, Stott, Lenin tries to overthrow the government, and they mm -hmm. go, "Well, I'm sorry, you got to go to Siberia." Guess what? He just comes back and he overthrows the government. Like that's how that works. Yeah. And other people have learned from that, and they're like, "Oh no 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 no! You just got to behead them. Like mm -hmm. you got to behead all of them because." The second they get you, they're beheading you. Mm -hmm. Like they didn't, they they told uh, Czar Nicholas, like, 
no, no, no. We're gonna, I mean, they were so fucked up what they did to this guy. Whereas they, you know, you gotta remember all these, all these uh czars and the queen, like the queen Elizabeth, the one we got right now, mm-hmm. she's got like a third grade education. Like she's not the most intelligent woman. Yeah, they in the world. didn't educate the women in the royal family. Yeah, they basically said, Oh, here's how you hold a scepter, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. And then you're gonna look to your left, then to your right. Everyone's gonna kneel first. Like they didn't go like Oh, here's how you, this is what politics are. This is what you should know about your country. They didn't teach her any of that. Like literally Winston Churchill came in and was like, well, you don't know anything. Yeah. Right, yeah, she yeah. Was like, he was like, you uh, like, they didn't tell the queen how black a mixed race baby would be. So she had to ask. <laughs> like, they never taught her fractions. <laughs> wait, wait, they never, they didn't, she, had, she had to be the one with her third grade education going, all right. <laughs> So, I've never seen one up close. I didn't study pundit squares or whatever those things were with the eye color, oh, yeah. blue, blue, blah, blah, blah. But, uh, how so much, what do you think? How much cream are you putting in my tea? <laughs> that much? So, so, maybe she was a little more coy. So, I have a Starbucks here, okay? And right next to you is a cup of half and half. She showed me the cup, what I can expect. <laughs> It probably wasn't the handlers too. They're probably like third grade. Third grade. Just let it, please let it roll off your back. Please. Oh my God. My friend Jerry Red Wilson had this great joke about the queen. People have probably heard this. I'm sure you heard it, but um, she's playing, they're playing a parlor game of, uh, you give clues. I forget what the game is called, but you give clues and you have to guess the answer. Oh. And the uh, the answer is they they give it to her. Uh, they give it to somebody and they go, uh, all right, it's moose cock. And he's like, you want me to give clues to the queen from Moosecock? I'm like, yeah, yeah, just play. It'll be fun. Just play. And they go, all right. So she gets to ask questions and she goes, um, can you eat it? And they were like, yeah. And she goes, Moosecock? Short game. Had you heard that? Did you no, I haven't heard that. Oh, my, one of my favorite things in the world in the world is to uh is i i went to dinner to lunch with the i wish i had new names because then I, it would be nicer because now right now it sounds like I, it, I i'm dismissive and i don't care yeah i went to lunch with the manager i know his name i just can't remember right now the manager of the richmond funny bone he's an old comic and uh and we worked together when he was a comic and now he's managing the richmond funny bone you know he just went through old comics jokes that i hadn't heard like guys that i just had never heard of and i was laughing oh yeah so hard he said one of the ones was uh he goes (laughs) oh fuck i wish i had his number because i just don't oh i'm the norm so i work with norm mcdonald and i'm like it's like everything in my i'm like please remember don't forget this joke don't forget this joke and i just forget it Yeah. yeah that would be a great podcast as people come on comics and just bring a dozen of your favorite other comics jokes. And we give him credit and just tell those jokes. He goes, he goes, uh, he goes, I, w- I went on a blind date with an actual blind girl. This is, is an old comics mm-hmm. joke. And he goes, people go, how, how do you date a blind girl? And he goes, well, I don't know, but I can tell you how you break up with her. <laughs> just take her to the parking lot, leg over her hand. <laughs> <laughs> He's I this this I, I'm gonna see if I can find this because every online. comic you know no matter how bad a comic is not every comic but most of them have one great quotable joke mm-hmm. and some of them have fucking hundreds like David Feldman you oh know David God. Feldman no Bert he's this guy who's a comic out of San Francisco he's been doing it for 35 years and a writer who you probably worked with oh no before, I did right? on the Jeff Ross's The Burn yeah I mean I've worked with him other places too but he yeah he's he writes he's a great master jokes. joke writer and one of his jokes that I always quote is uh, he goes to see that and this is an older joke as you can tell he went to see that movie Indecent Proposal yeah. with uh, Richard Gere and Demi Moore and uh, and they come out and she goes wow he, he let a he let a guy sleep with his wife for a million dollars would would you let somebody do that with me? And he goes, well, I don't think we get a million, but I think we get 50 bucks 20,000 times. <laughs> Meanwhile, by the way, on the, bur- on the burn, uh, that week, 
Because this is the difference between like a joke writer like me who's just writing topical jokes. It's a whole business plan. He's already got the whole oh, business so plan good. worked out. I think you get 50 bucks for 20,000 times. It's perfect. Yeah. But it's like a craftsman. That's what he yeah, is. Yeah. So that's what I was saying. Like, uh, like oh. topical jokes, I can write them. People can write them. A lot of people can write them. He like sits down. So it was the burn with Jeff Ross that week. It was this news story, which Ireland was considering raising the DUI uh, like from 0.08 to 0.09 or whatever, because the pubs were kind of dying. And in a totally rural area where you're not even, whatever, controversial issue, we tackled it. Anyway, jokes come in about blah, 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 blah. Here comes Feldman's joke comes in. And he's like, yeah, and the DUI test in Ireland is you pull the person over, you talk about their mother. If they punch you in the face, they're sober. If they start crying, they're drunk. <laughs> I'm like, how did you get to that? Like, you just wrote a oh. classic joke yeah. on a topical right. story. Right, right. And I, with a double punchline. Oh. Yeah. Wait, yeah. Have you ever heard Bur one of Burr's favorite jokes that he tells me every time and I always forget it? Have you ever heard about the the gorilla that fucked the lion? Oh, my God. You ever I, heard that? Oh, that I think familiar. it was in, I think, uh, the, the magician comic. What's his name? Gallagher? No. Uh, 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 amazing Jonathan. I think he might have told in the aristocrats or whatever. I, but uh, anyway, I love it. He goes, uh, he goes, the lions in the jungle and he's thirsty and he goes over to a pond and he kind of leans over to take a little sip of water. And as he does, his tail raises in an air, it raises in the air. And his gorilla, horny gorilla, sees that, gets turned on, comes up, runs up behind him and gives him the old Liberace real quick, right? <laughs> Pops out and the lion's like, ah, and the gorilla just takes off running. The lion's chasing him, gorilla's running, lion's chasing him. All of a sudden, gorilla runs up on a big uh, camp, like an empty camp, and he just, real quick, he looks around and he puts on a pair of khaki pants, puts on a hat, and he grabs the New York Times and he just pretends to be reading. <laughs> and the lion comes up and he goes, hey, 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 have you seen a gorilla come run through the? And the gorilla lowers it and he goes, you mean the one that fucked that lion in the ass? And the lion goes, it's already in the papers. <laughs> so great. And Bill, every time he tells it, he goes, he goes, this is what I love it. He, he goes, he goes, he goes, you need to hear fucked him in the ass and you need to say it's in the papers. Yeah. And he goes, you, so you can't say it twice. That's why he gave him the old Liberace and he picked up yeah. the New York Times. Yeah. I'm like, oh, there was one line this guy told me we were eating dinner. And he goes, yeah, we'll go out to dinner. With uh, you ever go out to a Chinese restaurant with a with, with your <laughs> Asian friend? And he goes, he goes, he goes, and you just don't know what to order, and you're like, uh, and he's like, okay, I guess. And then the waiter goes, I guess that's uh, well, I'll have a bowl of rice and some chicken, and then uh, he's gonna have a bowl of hummingbird dicks or whatever the fuck. The punchline <laughs> was hummingbird dicks, and I was laughing so hard, and I go, and I don't remember what the fucking joke was, but hummingbird dicks. <laughs> just fucking floored me. It'll take a bowl of hummingbird dicks. I thought you said the joke in the Chinese restaurant. I don't know whose joke this is, but it was some stand up I saw. And he's like, you know, they give you the bill. Oh, and yeah, it's I love this. In Chinese. Like, how are you going to argue with that? Like, uh, who ordered the house falling down? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who got the squirrel with a hat? <laughs> Did you charge this for two houses falling down? <laughs> yeah, I would listen to a. Oh, this is one of my favorite jokes. This is one of my favorite, favorite jokes. I don't know this comic. Everyone's always hit me up and go, this is the yeah. comic, right? Apparently, this is the same comic. Now, there's a, uh, it's the beauty of doing those festivals where you go to like Australia for a, or like South Africa for a month and you just live with other comics. And then they tell you their best comics jokes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he said there was a, there was a British comic whose joke was, um, um, I went in to see Schindler's List uh, last week with my girlfriend. We were about 10 minutes late to the movie. What did the Jews do to Hitler? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. Great joke. That's funny. And so it's good. So this, so this, I think it's the same guy. I wish, I wish there was a British comment that could correct me or, or, but I, so the, the, I'll, I'll just say it's a different guy just in case. So there's this guy who's like, who's like a comics comic in, in London. He's like comics comic. Like that's, he just is obsessed with comedy and his, girlfriend was going to break up with him and this is the true story right the true mm -hmm. story his girlfriend was going to break up with him and she goes she goes i i can't i can't live comedy like i understand you can live comedy but i can't live comedy that can't be my every night and he's like it's fine 
I can not, I can do not comedy. She goes, you can do not comedy. <laughs> He's like, let's go to dinner and I'll show it to you. And she goes, you can do, you can talk to me about something that isn't comedy for how long? And he goes, 20 minutes. And she goes, you can talk to me about something that's not comedy for 20 minutes. He goes, yeah, just give me the light at five. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <clears throat> oh, um, I could, I could sit and talk about other comics jokes all fucking day long. Oh. Just the guys in Boston had such fucking great jokes. It was uh, Mike Mike Donovan uh, does he do this bit about the uh, uh, toll taker? And you pull up, and the guy's like, you hand him a twenty, and he goes, "Do you have change?" No, that's literally what you do. That's your job. You can be replaced by a basket. <laughs> by a basket. <laughs> Well, that's when comedians are at their best, too. Like, they notice that. Like, and again, I don't know which comedian, but I remember when the doormen were going on strike in New York. And just like, comedians, just like, so what are they going to do? Uh, just stand in front of the building? Yeah. <laughs> They're going to go on strike yeah, and stand right, in front right, of the building? Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's perfect. Oh. Yeah. I wish I had any of those in my act. Like, you go, like, you look at like great, like, sometimes it's like the comics, like, like, say, like Dan Natterman, right? Who's just a great comic. Mm -hmm. I remember, and like a joke he just threw away one time, but it, you hear it in Natterman's. He's like, ah, I heard they, when you go to prison, they fuck you in the ass with a dick. They put a dick in your ass. You're going to start me off with like a magic marker first and work your way up to the dick. And he's just like, that's brilliant. He's like, ah, no, and just walks away from it. You're like, yeah. I would fucking hang my hat on that yeah, joke. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's why a lot of guys that are amazing joke writers, but don't have the performance ability that you have. Go into writing. Like I know a ton of guys, guys like Jonathan Groff, who you know, who's one of the biggest showrunners in Hollywood now, and yeah. uh, Paul Kozlowski and uh, Mike Royce. They were great writers. They were decent performers, but they made so much more money writing for guys like you. Oh, I would love, I would love to do like the famous comic thing and get writers for my next hour. <laughs> I would love that. I would love I just can't do it. I just, I mean, Tosh gave me a great joke one time and I just couldn't take it. I couldn't take it. Yeah. And he was like, hey, it's yours. He, I had a joke about wanting to date a black chick and, and it was a, kind of an act out, but f fun, long act out. I, I've never put in anything. He was like, yeah, it's, and it wasn't working. And he goes, you need something to, you need something to, you need a joke first. And then that act out. Like if you do a joke first, oh, then yeah. that act out, I think it would work better. And, it's funny because I kind of started looking at when I needed a long story. At the time, what I would do is then tell a joke and then get into my long story. I was like, oh, that works, man. Thanks. He was like, oh, I can give you a joke for that dating a black chick one. And I was like, what is it? And he was like, uh, "Just you should start and go, I've always wanted to date a black chick just as long as she's never had sex with a black guy. You know what I mean? Like, I, <laughs> and I was like, I was like, oh, that's great. And then I just, I couldn't use it because I was yeah. like, I didn't write it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I feel like I have to give somebody credit. Every, although Atel is amazing at just going like, no, change that word from land to territory. And all of a sudden the joke goes from being a five to a nine with yeah. one word change. Yeah. He's amazing. Uh, he he gave me the, I had a joke. I it's a true story. And every, everything I always had was like a true story. And then I just leave it there. Mm -hmm. And that was true. But I went, um, I, when the movie Beat Street came out, I was got in, like involved in tagging i was a fucking mm -hmm. white kid living in a really? community just fucking like an idiot the first day i took a spray can of spray paint and was like chick, 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 and then wrote bert on right above faircloth estates i wrote bert <laughs> and i was like oh fuck there's only one person's neighborhood and then it goes it just very casually goes well what did you have to write underneath it huh and i went sucks cock <laughs> and i was like god damn it that's a good fix thanks dave <laughs> i was like shit like like you couldn't just but i just went burt and it's true yeah, i was like yeah. just, well, that I reminds done. that reminds me actually of, remember a tells joke about it's whatever you wake up and you're completely hung over and you see you have a i love men tattoo <laughs> and he's like so i got it fixed i don't know if it's much better it's i love menudo <laughs> He said, he uh, said on, we were, we were on, uh, we were in Vegas and I'm fucking wasted. Right. Yeah. But just in like the perfect way we had, we'd started drinking here. This is this Vegas comedy fest. They don't do anymore. Zappos did it. 
This is back when he was drinking? No, the, no, 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 no. I was drinking until yeah. I was sober. And we fly, we don't have to do, no one has to do shows. We fly over, we drink on this private jet. They flew us all over in a private wow. jet. We all drink, everyone's partying. It's all of us. It's like like 20 comics. And then everyone's like, a tell's playing tonight. Let's go watch a tell. So we sit in the back. I've never laughed so fucking hard. At jokes, I would go, that's the greatest joke I've ever written, throwaways for him. Oh. Is it just me or does an owl look like an attorney for a parrot? <laughs> and you just, and I'm in the back crying, laughing. Yeah, yeah. And he goes, I can hear Bert laughing. <laughs> okay, we got it, Bert. You're in the room. Now quiet down. Just fucking. Oh. Yeah. I was, uh, well, you introduced me to him early on and I was then working at HBO and then he had a half hour. So I got to shoot some stuff actually out here in the desert with him. But I, I like became <laughs> this fanboy of like, because it was, Three, the cellar was like three blocks from my house and I would go see these guys like all the time. And one time, like I go downstairs in the cellar because a lot of comics would be upstairs. Maybe it's still the case. And then you'd see like a tell like the monitor behind the bar and you'd see who goes on. And then like, you know, the back, the back of the room goes down and it's going to, Oh yeah. So anyway, but I, I remember going down once and I'm walking to the bathroom though. And he's like, you again, like, <laughs> like no one in the crowd knows what's going on. Yeah. But I was like upset, but it was like, I would tell people, it was like four blocks away at the Blue Note, like seeing jazz. Cause it was seven nights a week. He would do like 1245 or whatever it was. And it was different every night. So smart. Yeah. He'd start into his like crowd work, which was just like creating, like, you guys look like a cop team, like, you know, and yeah. he would just paint story. It was unbelievable that guy. I remember him walking at the Boston Comedy Club back way back when. There was, it's, you know, on NYU's campus, basically. And there, there was these four uh, Chinese girls sitting at the end and they're all dressed in black and they're smoking and they're not laughing. And he just walks over and he just looks at them for like 10 seconds, doesn't say anything. And he goes, could you be more Asian? <laughs> and people laugh for like 10 minutes. He just fucking nailed it. He's he's like, his crowd work is as good as probably anybody that's ever done it. Oh. He sizes people up. Yeah. And like, he gives us that gift. Yeah. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, he so was. There's a story about, like, he, he was on stage and somebody screamed out, uh, I fucked your mother. And he goes, welcome to AIDS. <laughs> <laughs> he is, he is the, he's like my favorite. Like, uh, probably, I remember Dimitri Martin was like, when we first started, was like, have you ever seen David Tell? And I was like, no. He goes, oh, we should go watch him. I was like, really? So I was like, how do we get in? He was like, I was sitting in the back of the table at the cellar. I went back and sat there, and I I had no frame of reference. And he followed someone like, you know, someone who wasn't as dirty. Um, like, I, I wish I could say a name. Gaffigan. So, yeah, Gaffigan. Perfect. He followed Gaffigan. And he goes up, and, and he goes, well, okay, that was interesting. Apparently, Jim likes to talk about how men and women are so different. Well, I'm not that type of comic. I like to point out our similarities. For instance, men and women are the same. We're on their own fire. <laughs> it's not my <laughs> vagina's on fire. Put me out now. My daughters, my daughters quote David Tell, not noting they're quote, quoting David Tell. Yeah. Boogily, watch out. All right. Because my wife has said it so much. Wow. My wife, we we listen to Skanks for the Memories on repeat. That's that the, album is so tight. It's the best yeah, fucking every comedy joke album. Joke is just killer. They, you know what they should do? They should release that. Bad pitch, <laughs> bad pitch. Dave Attell should re-release that as a special, but l like lip sync to it the way they did in Tarzan with uh, that lady. You know who couldn't talk? They should have a guy go up and play a tell and lip sync to like like the fucking lady that did the like oh perfect this is a brilliant idea yeah the lady that did the the special for Netflix where she just lip synced Don Donald Trump oh right 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 yeah right, yeah, yeah. Oh, they should have yeah. some there's got to be TikTok kids who could do yeah yeah why haven't TikTok right. kids found yeah. David Tell right like oh those girls that I've seen girls do the my bits and put on makeup. And they get millions of views. Really? Oh, millions of views. They all do my jokes about my daughter Isla. They they do all those and put on makeup. And then wow. And then you get like a million followers from it. Right. That's how we get David Tell. Wow. Uh, That's good. I like that. Yeah. Do you so think I he, walk up to this girl in the bar and I realize she's got a black eye and I think, great, she's seeing somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of McNuggets later, we're back at her place and I'm having sex with a doggy style. <laughs> 
I didn't plan it that way, but that's how she passed out. <laughs> anyway, like just one into the next. Oh, yeah. Dave, who's next? The Eskimos? That's right. <laughs> or, or as I call them, the Snow Mexicans. <laughs> Dude, he is the great. Wear a condom. No one has freckles on their ass. I just remember going in. Remember, there was a there was a point where he was so bored, even with his own material, and he hated. It. He's like, he's like, that's right, the Amish, yeah, and, yeah. and he would just sing his routine. Yeah, that's right, the Amish. Right, right. <laughs> those pancake eaters. Those, what did those Sarah Baker's have had to do? What was uh oh the one that the one that me and my buddies to this day quote. He was like, uh, you should have been there. And all the good stuff happens when you leave. You should have been there <laughs> just as you left. And he had nine different versions. And the one that, like, and you'd hear him do the nine, oh, just before you left, just after you left, the Dixie Chicks book showed up and they blew everybody. And then he had, <laughs> and then the one that me and my buddy Tony Hernandez to this day say, even the guy with, even the kid with the Babylon 5 t shirt got a blow job. <laughs> Even the kid with the Babylon 5 t shirt. <laughs> oh my oh. God. Uh. Dave, uh, G Big J said to me, I was always fascinated how Dave worked in that he would, uh, he would just kind of like, you could, it was like he would change everything up every now and then. And then you'd have a thing that you'd watch him working on where he couldn't figure it out, like hitting someone in the back of the head with a hammer, right? Like I watched him work that premise out of like nine different ways. And then Big J, one time I was hanging out with him and he goes, yeah, tells mom's sick and I know where she lives. And I said, why? And he goes, I think she lives by me because Dave's driving out. He said he was driving out there every day. And he, he's made a few references to things I see when I drive out. And he, those are his references now. And it's oh, just Dave driving going, oh, mm -hmm. all right. Yeah, a yeah, bowling yeah. alley. Attached yeah. to a, and, and, and he's like, isn't that fucking fascinating? And I was like, yeah. And, he, and then Jay asked him and he's like, yeah, his mom lives right by where Jay was living. But I, I, I miss, I miss just, just straight being a comic where like all your ideas are tried out on stage yeah. as opposed to like, right. pop, like now it's like, you got to really temper. Like I have a great end to this fucking, I, th I think I have a great end to this cat calling bit, but you got to hold on to it and then wait until you do stand up in four yeah. fucking months again. Right. And also you're doing an hour, so it's not the same as like, all right, I got a piece of paper in my pocket of 12 minutes of new things that I'm working on four sets a night. And so it's just in your head and you're really yeah. working it out. Yeah. Here, I'll tell you what I'm, this, these are the thoughts that I, that have popped in lately. These are my, all my new thoughts. Oh, it's cat calling. Uh, Isla taking a test. My, this is, made me, this made me laugh so hard. Uh, by the way, I got to put in, uh, my daughter saying I'm an al ally. Yeah. Uh, Georgia ally um uh my daughter was taking a test in class and during that room and i and i walk in and i just see her go alexa when did world war ii start <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious <laughs> fucking killed me oh that's funny <laughs> um that's all i got <laughs> that's good uh, unintelligent people like sharing bad news i'm obsessed with that i just feel like unintelligent people like sharing bad news yeah. Oh yeah. It makes it about them too. I yeah. mean, every kind of everyone does. Yeah. Like how fast are you like, Holy shit, whatever is going down and you learn you're an early, you know, you're onto it early. Yeah. Yeah. Um, getting back to that New York crew for just for one second that when I was obsessed with tell. So when I was working at HBO, my boss was like, uh, they then kind of put me in, I was at on air HBO's on air promos. So that's why I was promoting a tells half hour and, and all these sort of unknowns it was ray romano atel louis ck oh, wow. this is 94 maybe or something like that and they all had half hours anyway jeff stilson uh, i'm trying to think who else anyway but i remember him like you know what and it was when hbo was changing their slogan and they came up with it's not tv that wasn't around yet i forget what the one before it was but they're like we really, he goes, I want to beat this ad agency, like one of the most expensive ad agencies, Saatchi and Saatchi, whatever had been hired. And he goes, I think on air promos, we're an ad agency within HBO. He goes, I think we can beat it. He goes, why don't, Gibbons, why don't you get some of those comedians you love down from the cellar or whatever? And I'm like, all right. And I'm like, you know, like, like kinda, I can ask any of them that they're broke. They'd love to do this. He's like, 
really go outside the box. I'm like, okay. And so you <laughs> cut to my boss coming in the door and there's a very young, inexperienced Gaffigan and Todd Barry just sitting there. <laughs> and basically they work all day writing stuff and they hand it in. At the end of the day, my boss comes up to me. He's like, all right, more inside the box. <laughs> <laughs> Like total lunatics, yeah. especially Todd Barry. I had a meeting with uh, Spike one time back when Spike was a thing. And they're like, Spike's looking for some really like outside pitches. And yeah. I go, you got the right guy. Yeah. And they're like, okay. And so I went in and I pit, I pitched, can I, can I kidnap your child? <laughs> and I was like, here's the show, <laughs> right? You know that I'm trying to kidnap your child. You got one week. Can't change anything up. Just regular. Right. Talk to your kid if you want. Regular. Yeah. I see if I can kidnap your child. If I get your child, he's fine. He's going to grandma. We're sending him to Disney World. And that's when the game show begins. Because now you got to negotiate the safe release of your child. <laughs> You've got to acquire the funds. Can you get a bank loan for a million dollars? Do you make the drop? Do you incorporate the police? Yeah. If you can get your child back safely, you keep the money. <laughs> and they're like, oh, wow. That's not what we were thinking. I mean, I had so many out-of-the-box ideas. <laughs> When I was like, people would be like, tell me a show. I remember, I, I'm not even joking. And by the way, I'm still kind of trying to pitch this over to at Discovery Plus. Like still. Can't wait. I wanted to do a show called Moat Crashers where, you know, like bath crashers or yard crashers yeah. or kitchen crashers. Well, I said, what about moat crashers? Every man's house is his castle. Every castle deserves a moat. You go to a Lowe's, a Home Depot, find a guy in the shovel section, go up to him and go, hey, man, are you guys building a moat today? He's going to be like, no. You go, you want one? And he'll be like, you know, one asshole's like, I'll take a fucking moat. Right. And you build him a fully functioning operational moat. <laughs> I go, listen, just, just tell me. You'd watch the thing. You'd be like, I got to see the fucking reveal yeah. of here's your moat. And then they were like, we were drunk and we were at uh, at an upfront for, and I'm looking at the head of, of, of DIY and HGTV just go, no why would anyone want a moat and i go it doesn't it's i'm not saying do you want a moat i'm saying would you watch someone build a moat she's right. like do you have any other ideas and i go okay what about a show called bathrooms 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 <laughs> where i go into your house and turn every room into a bathroom <laughs> i go now listen it's not great for the homeowner it's a great reveal but if you're in the business of putting a bathroom in your new house yeah. this is the show we got nine yeah. bathrooms we're building <laughs> And I go, and imagine the reveal of the guy comes in his house. Like, what the fuck happened to my living room? I go, you mean your bathroom? And she goes, oh, my God. Now people are laughing. Wait, you went into a room and pitched this? Who's was drunk at a bar oh. at, 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 at Upfronts. Oh. So this is like nice, Upfronts yeah. are over. Everyone's left. Yeah. And then I go, okay, last one. I go, blind design. We have a blind guy coming in to design a house. I go, just just imagine the third act when the guy walks in. And he's like, what the fuck? And he's like, oh, who did this? It's the guy talking to the refrigerator over yeah. there. Come on, we'll go we'll go meet him. And they were like, I don't see the, any of these. <laughs> I, I, pitched, I pitched dentured adventures where I go into an old age house and I go, all right, what are your dreams? Let's make them true today. And I was like, all right, Betsy wants to go skydiving. We're all going skydiving. And then in order to stay to get your dream accomplished, you had to do all the dreams of everyone, like their lifetime dreams. And they just passed on all of them. Yeah. And literally, I just had a meeting with Discovery Plus, and I was we're trying to do something else. And then I was like, I'm not joking. I still want to do moat. I think moat crashers. Like you'd, <laughs> do you remember those ideas? You'd see a commercial, and it would be like, tiny house. These people are gonna live in a tiny yeah. house. And party was like, I'd watch it. And they're like, bad idea, right? And you're like, oh, I actually was looking for it on my DVR. Yeah. yeah. I but, remember once coming up with like. I forget why I thought of them, but I thought of a bunch of reality shows that were a spoof. This is when reality shows were just starting. Yeah. And I thought of a bunch parodying reality shows and um, didn't sell the show that this was based on. And then years later, I get a call from, I just start seeing each one of them become a reality show. Really? One of which was our friend Rabi came up with one uh, called Green Card. And it was people that were undocumented workers competing and the winner gets a green card. Oh. And I get a call from him going, hey, you want to host this pilot we're doing? It's <laughs> it was like, that's the fucking show I was kidding about. Oh and it's real. God. Yeah. That I remember, yeah, I remember really early on my dad being like, uh, hey, it was like one of his friends. He goes, he heard you're in television. He's like, how about this? And this is before basically reality shows. He's like, what about this idea for reality show? Uh, group therapy. You just like show group therapy. I'm like, 
uh, I don't think that's a show. He's like, no, remember like the group therapy on Newhart and how funny that was. Meanwhile, there's a fucking bit like whether it's, oh my God, there's a million group therapy shows now. Inter- yeah. All the drug ones, of right, course, but right. it's like, oh. and, uh, it's so, it's so funny how, yeah, sometimes you're like, I don't think that would work. Like, how would you get those people to participate? Who's going to share on, who's going to share on who's camera was one of my camera. genius. Yeah. Yeah. Real insightful. I got pitched over a, over a, uh, a jug of moonshine by Le- one of Leanne's family members. It was like, all right, you can make a movie, right? And I was like, I know I can't. I'm, <laughs> I definitely can. He was like, here's my pitch. It's called the fun bunch. Now, bunch of guys, right? With hot wives that like to swing, travel around the world in hot air balloons. And they go to places that aren't so fun, right? Like Africa. And they show them how to have a good time and have sex, you know? And I'm just like, <laughs> I love the hot air balloons yeah. much. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, get up in the hot air balloons. <laughs> they're having. I'm talking. They're drinking beers and having a good time. You know, bikinis, all good looking women. What do you think? You think we get that made? And I part of me wanted to be like, I'm. I'd green light it. Yeah, I'm in. I, I'd want to. I'll star in it. I right. just. Yeah. Oh, dude, there's one that's actually. I don't know if people would think this was funny, but the execution of it is actually beautiful, and it's like people on. It's called Love on the Spectrum. I have Segura loved that show and everyone's talked about it. I've never seen it though. I was yeah. just, I couldn't stop talking about it also. Yeah, it's beautiful and it really is like it you, there's moments where you oh, you I laugh, but some. you're you're laughing in the right reasons. And I, I actually work with people with intellectual disabilities a lot. I do the best buddies. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And so like I have fallen in love with people that have this challenge. And you realize like if you're in the presence of these people. They're so pure. They don't have oh, no. any agenda. They don't have Bert, any. That, that's what you'll love about it. That's what I think comedians also loved about. Like, it's like, oh my God, this is the most honest. Like, that's what a first date should be. Like, what, so I actually wrote some down. So there's one date and and this, this autistic girl goes, um, yeah. And they're talking. She's like, well, you know, I couldn't speak till I was seven. And like that just like sat there. She's like, I guess you could say I'm the whole package. And I'm just like, <laughs> oh, my God, I'm, in, I'm just in love with you. And then another guy, it's like the guy's like, oh, my favorite guy, Michael or whatever. You fall in love with all of them. Yeah. He's like, oh, you're 22. You were born in 1997. Same year as Men in Black. <laughs> <laughs> but. And then oh, wait, what, what, another one was like, um, well, and he's like, well, what kind of people? Like, and, and it's super awkward at times. And uh, she's like, well, what kind of um people, you know, do you like? Are you, you know, do you, do you date or whatever? He's like, well, I like Asians and I, I like Mexicans. And <laughs> and there's a long pause, and she's like, well, I'm neither. <laughs> <laughs> well, that girl was super smart, and I just yeah. remember, I remember like no, there was a couple. Yeah, most of them were pretty smart i think you they know? were smart but some had would you find people that have autism sometimes it's it's just that they can't read your emotions they don't have yeah. like an empathy that most people have and so you have these two people and you see them separately and they're struggling with you know one guy loves dinosaurs and like that keeps him happy yeah. and so like he takes a girl on a date and and you know that she struggles with ocd and like all these different she barely get out of the house and the, and they you see them have a nice date where he takes her and he shows her Tyrannosaurus Rex and he's so excited and they're engaged and then at the end and you're like thank God they've there's a couple here and then they interview her and she's like I wasn't feeling it and you're like what <laughs> you're gonna go back and be alone in your yeah. home oh that's great yeah. they're so honest to each other yeah uh, so wait why is it then why is it that like and I I, I say stereotypically but when we were kids. If you were special or different, that was to be mocked. And now I find it, I mean, everyone finds it so engaging and heartwarming. Like I follow these people on TikTok. I follow a family that has just kids with Down syndrome and I am fucking in love with these kids. Yeah. And then I, I follow this guy today who's autistic and it. Uh, I followed him. His uh, Someone gave, they got his like favorite soda and they were showing him his favorite sodas in the fridge and he lost his shit. He's, and it's, it's, it's like, mm-hmm. but why didn't, why wasn't there sensitivity to that when we were kids? Like, cause it was, yeah, yeah, what is that? I have no idea. Like, I remember if you were different as a kid, it, you just got, it was yeah, torture. Right. Is right. it still in play? Like it's not really, no. it's, well, it's not in LA. 
But seventh graders, where we're all from, it's not as much, you don't think? I think there is way more acceptance. I'll, I'll, tell, yeah, I'll, put, so. I'll take it this far. We watched uh, Ace Ventura, and my daughters are like, are, are we supposed to be laughing at this? Oh. And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, They've, he has special needs. And I was like, oh. You mean like every Sandler character? Yeah, and I was like, oh, wait, what? Ugh, this doesn't. Yeah. Dumb like, and no, dumber? It, yeah, and I was like, yeah. I was like, no, it's not, they're not, it's not special needs, like, uh. <laughs> Like it's he's Ace Ventura. He's like a fucking yeah. He's like yeah. a fucking weirdo. And I was like, oh, and, oh right. Yeah. And they just didn't find it funny. They were like, I don't get it. Like I don't, I don't know why I would laugh at a guy who is just this weird. And you're oh. like, oh, what do you find funny? I haven't mm. watched something about Mary yet, but I remember the scene that the guy did. He's incredibly physical on the crutches yeah. when he dropped his keys. Oh my god. I just and I by the way I still howl at that scene. I don't know what that would be like watching with my daughters when yeah. I'm dying laughing at an able-bodied actor like doing the crutches yeah. routine. Yeah. I don't know how that's going to go. But there was Oh there was wow, this... that's that's right. I didn't even think an able-bodied actor doing like mocking and with no malintent, of course, but like, I don't know how it'll go over. There's this comic named Michael Aronson. He's out of like Baltimore or Philly. And uh, the first time I was working with him, I was at the Stress Factory in New Jersey. <laughs> what a name. The Stress Factory. And it was stressful. That's my house. And and they, uh, <laughs> and they so Vinny tells me the, uh, the feature act is going to pick you up at the hotel and bring you to the club. And he doesn't tell me anything about him. So... I get to the lobby of the hotel and there's this guy who's completely palsied, Michael Aronson. I mean, you know, wrist bent and, yeah. you know, shuffling one leg, dragging me like full on. And so we, I say, how you doing? I'm Greg. I'm Michael. Great. So we walk outside and his car is parked at the valet and he walks around, takes him like five minutes to walk around his door. <laughs> and I walk over to the passenger door and I just stand there and he goes to get in. And I said, Michael, and he just looks at me, he's like, what? I go, my door. <laughs> and there's all these people at valet like watching. <laughs> and he just looks at me and he goes, like, I'm fucking crazy. And I see him smile and he fucking drags his palsied ass <laughs> all the way around the car. It takes five minutes and I'm just waiting with my arms crossed. And he has to like back up to the door to get it open with his hand. And he opens it up and I get in and people are just shaking their heads like, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? And he fucking laughed all the way to the club, got to the club. We parked in front. Same thing. Sat in the passenger seat, waited for him to come all the way around. Oh. I did it every fucking night that weekend. Oh man, <laughs> I dated a I dated a chick with cerebral palsy on accident. I didn't. I we were just partying so hard. I didn't know she had palsy. And true story, I wrote about it in my book. And uh, my buddies were like, "You should go out with her in the daytime." Like I think something's going on with her. So I went out in the daytime and I noticed in the daytime, I noticed it's sober. I was like, oh shit. She's not a great jet. She's not a great jet skier. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> she, she was, she, she wasn't a great jet skier. <laughs> she, was, she was, she was so fucking hot. I mean, she looked like if this is going to sound crazy, but everyone said she looked like Sarah Michelle Geller, but hotter that fucking, and I mean that, that also you're just fucking yeah. blown away that a hot chick wants to hang out with you or anything you're ignoring. But <laughs> I, it took me like three days before I realized she had cerebral palsy. And I was like, oh, fuck. Like, and then I kept dating her. She was a cool chick. Sarah her, Michelle Helper. Yeah. And so <laughs> so I took her to Scotland. Uh, she fl flew to Scotland. I was doing Edinburgh with Patrice and Rich Voss. And I'm like, I'm not going to say anything. Like, I didn't notice. It was been, I did, took Wrong me three days. Wrong guys to be. <laughs> <laughs> Within five seconds. D like knock at the door i'm eating breakfast and patrice is like i got it goes over opens the door and he's like oh you must be bert's bitch and all i hear is wrong hand wrong hand wrong hand what am i the fuck what are you the queen am i gonna kiss that hand other hand oh shit what's wrong with your hand what's wrong with you oh we got a baby leg oh okay okay and I'm just like, oh, this is going to be a very, 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 <laughs> very, le very long. <laughs> did she like it or did no, she? Not at all. She didn't like it at all. She hated Patrice uh, more than any wow. one human being. 
would ever hate Patrice. And what makes things worse. And a lot of people hated Patrice. And she had booked the trip as if we'd stay there, you know, for like a couple of weeks or whatever. Yeah. And uh, halfway into the trip, I got a TV show and a deal. And they called. They're like, hey, you got to go fly back to L.A. And, uh, and fucking start TV. And so I was like, ah. I was like, I'm out. Deuces, baby. Guys, have a good time. I was like, that's my room. Feel free to stay there. Just don't bother Patrice. And Patrice called me. Call, like he would call me but you got to get this bitch out of here and she was they, and she was a vegetarian and patrice would just eat blood sausage and just lick it like just to torment her oh, they wait, hated each other she she was a comic no 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 she was just a hot she truck stayed for the trip she stayed because she was going to backpack and meet up with friends and do the thing and i said well you know my apartment this is my apartment too this room's available oh oh patrice fucking hated Jesus. her and she like I wow. bet if I could, if I called her and I told, if I could get a hold of her and told her Patrice passed away, that she'd smile. Yeah, I bet she'd be like, "Ah, thank God." Yeah, not a day too soon. That's right. Yeah. What was I? What was I going to say about? Oh, I got talk about a road gig. I did a college one time, and there's this kid that picks me up at the airport, and I'm a little buzzed. I've been drinking on the plane, and I get to the car, and he's like, "I'll be pulling up," and it's no, uh, it's a it's a two seater. With like a little tiny thing in the back, and there's no trunk room. I got all my bags, and I'm like, ugh, like where am I gonna put my bag? I got a bag, and I got merch, and so I go, hey, can I need? To, do you have, where am I gonna put this? And he's like, oh, I'll just put it on top of my wheelchair. And I'm like, what? And there's a <laughs> wheelchair sticking out the back like this. So I just dump it on the wheelchair and kind of place my bags there. And I look, and he is uh, paralyzed from the waist below. But he's got use of his hands, and I'm watching, and he's driving with his fingers, like drive, like it's almost like a like, duh, 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 and then breaking, and then and he's and I was like, wow, he's like, yeah, man, this is fucking. I gotta be honest with you, you know, I, obviously I don't want to be paralyzed, but driving is fun as fucking shit. And I said, really? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, it's like it's I gain my mobility, I can move, I can move on my own, and I feel good about myself and he goes and the way they got my car set up it's like a video game and like vroom, with his thumb and zzz, zzz, zzz. it was crazy so i was like really and he goes yeah like i and and he's flying through the streets and i'm just like woo. so that night we all go out we all go out and party we end up at a bar and he gets wasted wasted and we start walking out to the car and he's like and i'm like do you need me to drive or he's like no i'm fine and i was like you sure and he's like yeah He's like, come on, man. Gets in. I hop in wheelchair, put his wheelchair in the back. And he goes, gets in the thing, starts it up. And he goes, remember, it's like a video game. I'm like, yeah, but you're drunk <laughs> and you got nothing to lose. Like you already right. lost your legs. Yeah. And we ended up in a field doing donuts in this no. car. Just, oh, my and God. I, I was just like, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> wheelchair smashing around in the back of just, the car. <laughs> flying out the back. God. Uh, I right. saw that video, by the way, of the guy you know who climbed the Philly, the steps in Philly. Chase Chase Friedman. Yeah. Chase Friedman. Uh, do you hear this story? No. It's fucking fascinating. It's. I mean, it's not, hold on. Let me rephrase that. It's a horrific story, but it's a fascinating story to know where he is today. Um, New Year's Eve. I don't buy. I, I get bad. I, I get afraid telling his story, but I think I can. New Year's Eve goes to Philly, party with a bunch of friends. They go out, have a great time. It's way drunk. Middle of the night, gets up. And by the way, I don't know how drunk he was, just to uh -huh. be fair to Chase. I don't know how drunk he was. He never told me any of that. Parties with his friends. Gets up in the middle of the night to go take a piss. Doesn't remember anything. Wakes up to his friends. And apparently he had fallen while taking a piss and broke his neck. Quadriplegic. In the bathroom. Like fell, I'm guessing, hit his face on the toilet. Neck goes back, breaks his neck, and wakes up quadriplegic. How long ago was this? New Year's Eve. This New Year's this Eve? This New Year's Eve. Shit. This New Year's Eve. This sign, he brought this sign to me uh, like December 22nd and was like, uh, I was like, hey, what are you doing? And he was like, oh, we're going, I'm going to go stop in, whatchamacallit, visit someone that I'm going to Philly. And I was like, I thought COVID reasons. I was like, you be fucking careful. And he's like, mm -hmm. I'm fine. Breaks his neck. New Year's Eve, I get the phone call from our manager, my manager, Judy. He worked for Judy. And she said, yeah, Chase had an accident. He's he's paralyzed from the neck down. They don't know if he's going to get any of his feeling back and or anything. Yeah. And I was like, what? I mean, all broke all of these right back here. 
goes into surgery um and like you it's just day by day like all of a sudden he gets feeling and like a toe and he can move a finger and it's just and by the way he shows the he's te- he's the pictures he shows on the thing he's smiling and you're like where the fuck is that smile coming from i wouldn't have that smile right and um and then just be and then and you know we all start sending him messages he can't he's once a day one a nurse comes on and gets on his phone and reads him the messages and i know this guy scott who lives in arizona who went in for a back surgery one time and they fucked up and they paralyzed him from the neck down and this guy is a fucking savage he is walking around carrying like now he's carrying fucking logs on his shoulders i mean he's still got problems in one of his legs but he is he gained all his mobility back so i get him i get him connected with scott and i'm like yo chase this is scott scott's got a pretty crazy story too he can be some inspiration and this guy scott texts me he's like man this guy chase is gonna bounce back yeah and i go really and he goes yeah i think he's got the he goes it's a and segura had just gotten hurt and I have yeah. Segura text him, send him a message. And Segura is like, it's all about your attitude and rehab. If you, I mean, not obviously there's people that are in a wheelchair that will never get out of a wheelchair. But he's like, if you have the opportunity and you are willing to work at it, you can rehab. Uh, some people with Segura's injury, I would not chase his, some people with like a knee, they just don't rehab it. And then they told Segura, if you don't rehab your thing, your leg will stay atrophied and your arm will stay atrophied. Like, that's it. And so mm-hmm. Segura's like, who the fuck wants that? So Skur sends a message, Scott sends a message, and then I start getting videos of him the first time trying to walk, right? And then, and then it's another video of him. He got his finger working and he's flicking off the camera and he's smiling. And then he, and then I get another video of him walking out of the hospital. And he's like, and he's walking out of the hospital by himself. And then he says randomly, he's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, my goal in all my recovery was to walk up the Rocky Steps. And so Saturday. At 11 o'clock West Coast time, 2 o'clock East Coast time, I'm walking up the Rocky Steps. And he's like, if you want to be with me on Instagram. And so then fucking Sylvester Stallone retweets it. And then Arnold Schwarzenegger retweets it. And everyone starts retweeting it. And so I'm getting ready to do a podcast. I'm with Leanne. She wants to watch it. Podcast starts at 11. The guy, Nathan Florence, is in Hawaii. He's a surfer. He's just he's running a little late. And I was like, that's fine. Don't worry. Tell him to take his time. Leanne and I will watch it, but we'd already started recording for the Zoom, for the podcast. We have the mic on, camera on, and the phone's by the computer, and we're watching it, and it is, I mean, we are sobbing, crying. It's this guy doing the Rocky steps, and he's, every step is like, like a, uh, and he gets to the top, and he's like, I love that he goes, I want to thank three people, Sylvester Stallone, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Burt Kreischer. <laughs> Oh really? <laughs> yeah. Well, I but I'm I've been with him like throughout the thing oh, yeah, of yeah, like amazing. you know texting him with whatever. But yeah, and so now he's and then he calls me that night and I was like I'm with Leanne and he he's like hey I'm with a bunch of friends. I go where are you? He goes I'm up on a rooftop and he turns around and they're playing beer pong and I'm like are you drinking? He's like fuck yeah because yeah. I just walked up the <laughs> fucking rocky steps. Are you kidding me? I was like someone take him to the bathroom. <laughs> But yeah, it's a pretty inspirational story wow. when you think of like all the shit that's bad that could happen to you and yeah. then that you can actually, like if you told me I was going to break my neck and be paralyzed from the neck down, I I, I don't know if I would, I might give up. I might just be right. like, oh, I'm not going to fight, right. fight for this. Yeah, I watched Sopranos again. I've thought about that. What I've thought about uh, bed, um, like quadriplegic movies, series I'd start. Mm-hmm. And... <laughs> Like I've thought about, isn't that crazy? Yeah. Uh, Quantum Leap. I'd watch beginning to end. That's one thing. I I could just start watching and just, huh? Yeah. Quantum Leap. Um, I've never watched The Sopranos just in case, so that I have something locked and loaded. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I don't. I'd know. watch uh, Gilmore Girls because that's the only fucking way I could sit through it is if I couldn't move. <laughs> And it might get you out of bed just to turn it on. It might actually yeah. be like, he's I'm, walking. Put, yeah. he's walking. put the remote 10 feet away from me and he turn it on. the remote. <laughs> so well, then we'll go out on this joke since we were telling jokes. This relates to this. So there's this guy who works at a, uh, a carnival at Coney Island. And he's the amazing Marvin. He calls out to the crowd. He goes, I'm the amazing Marvin. I can cure anybody of anything. And so he says, anybody with an affliction, come up to the stage. And so this guy comes up on crutches. He can barely walk. He gets up front 
And he says, what's your name? And he says, uh, my name is Phil. And he said, well, what's the problem, Phil? And he goes, I've never walked a day in my life without these crutches. And so he helps him up on the stage. He says, go back behind that curtain. And today you will walk. Whole crowd goes, ooh. He says, anybody else out there have any other afflictions? Come up to the front of the stage. Guy comes up. He goes, uh, he goes what's your name? He says, Tommy. He goes, well, what's the problem, Tommy? He goes, I have a speech impediment. He goes, all right, Tommy, go back behind the stage there with uh, Phil. And today you're going to speak clearly for the rest of your life. Whole crowd goes, ooh. And now Marvin goes into this chant. He prays. He does a dance. He looks up to the sky. He collapses into a pile of sweat. Finally, he stands up. He looks at the curtain. He says, Phil, throw your crutches away. Tom, <laughs> speak. And Tom goes, Phil fell down. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> well, 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 well. Oh, oh, that was a great podcast, guys. That yeah. was solid. That was a fucking great podcast. Yeah. Oh, it started? <laughs> <laughs> you forgot the test. <laughs> when does <laughs> there's no one perfect announcement? Oh, uh, oh that was fucking perfect.